6.3 earthquake rocked parts of Mindanao this evening. A school in Dipolog City collapsed due to the earthquake. Bad things do happen in the world. People get hurt. Structures weaken. But once the dust settles and the sirens go quiet, ordinary men step up to do extraordinary things, to avoid future disasters and give people a chance to rise from the challenges. PICE, or the Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers, is an organization of civil engineers whose mission is to advance the welfare of our members and the development and prestige of the civil engineering profession. And to be a dynamic, we envision to be the leader among professional organizations known globally for professionalism, integrity, excellence and social responsibility, a key player in nation building. Engineering, particularly the civil engineering, sounds simple. We plan, we create and build structures and infrastructures and make sure that the people who will use it will be safe and secure. So they take on the challenge and do the work because stability does not happen by chance. ng Lindol, October 16, naisipan ko nang puntahan yung mga hospital na malapit sa amin para i-check yung mga structures kung okay. Then, kinabukasan, tumawag yung si Engineer Bong Suero. May instruction siya sa akin na magbuo ng team para gumawa ng mga rapid assessment sa mga nasira structures. Ang role ng uh, PDMP, PICE Disaster Mitigation Program, is uh, inaactivate siya ng uh, PICE in times of disasters no, like earthquake to evaluate and assess the uh, affected buildings and other structures. No? Nagkaroon po tayo ng mga immediate rapid evaluation and assessment doon sa mga buildings and may mga nakita tayong minor damages. Unfortunately, sumunod yung October 29 and October 31 na nagkaroon ng magnitude uh, 6.6 and 6.5. And uh, during that earthquake, dahil masyadong malapit yung gap nung nangyaring earthquake na yon, nagkaroon na po tayo ng malaking damage doon sa mga pinamaan na dati ng earthquake. Naging mahirap para sa community ng Kidapawan, lalong-lalo na doon sa mga businessmen and doon sa mga estudyante. Dito may nag-school nag, uh, sa gawas kay ang among classroom kay naapektuhan siya sa lindol. So dito na lang sa gawas nag-learn. Siyempre po natatakot po kasi ako baka po mag-lindol ulit. Nung nakita na namin yung damage ng lindol sa mga building namin, Sobrang nalungkot talaga ako. Hindi lang ako, pati yung mga teacher, mga parent, pati yung mga estudyante. Yung mga engineer sa PICA, sobrang laki yung naitulong nila o naiambag sa amin. Binigyan nila kami ng kaalaman, inassess nila yung mga building namin kung itong building na ito magagamit pa ba o hindi at sobrang laki ng tulong na iyon. Sa ganitong sakuna na lindol, napakalimbaga yung role ng PICE para matulungan maibangon yung mga munisipyo o probinsya na nasiraan ng lindol. Kasi nga, karamihan ng damages dito, it's not only yung mga tao mismo, kundi yung tinutuloy ng bahay, yung mga paaralan na nasira, yung mga public buildings na nasira, Ang PIC, ang Civil Engineers lang talaga yung makapag-conduct ng assessment kung ano ba talagang status or integrity ng building. Napakalaking bagay ang role ng 
PICE at sa mga ang Association ng Civil Engineers para makatulong sa mga ganitong sakula. One of the goal of PRC 11 is really to have an active collaboration with various APOs. So one of the very active APO in Region 11 is the PICE or the Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers. They have contributed many things like the roofing of our trellis. We are occupying a new office right now and PICE has been instrumental about it. One of the most significant participation of PICE is during the um, outreach program of the recent uh, series of earthquakes in Mindanao. We PWH, together with the Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers, nagdala kami ng mga relief goods, more or less 200 households. Frontliner doon is PICE. Naghanap kami ng funds. Hindi lang pala yung pag-assess natin yung magagawa ng PICE, kundi yung pagtulong sa kanila na bigyan silang ng mga relief goods. It is not just the help that we receive, they are looking at a greater impact in the community outside of PRC. A civil engineer talagang napakalaki ng role and responsibilities sa community. As a PI scholar, thank you so much po PICE. Binigyan nyo kami ng pag-asa po talaga na pagpatuloy yung pag-aaral namin sa kabila ng kahirapan. Dati po akong working student then so I am financially incapable sa aking pag-aaral. Napakalaking tulong ng PICE both sa career building at financial na tulong na nakuha ko galing sa pagiging PICE scholar. Fueled by the same passion and commitment to our profession, every member of PICE works tirelessly to push forward our mission and vision of becoming a key contributor to nation building. ASHER is a 24-7 structural health building monitoring system. So, sa pamamagitan ng equipment na ito, malalaman natin kung paano natin masisiguro yung kahandaan ng ating buildings or other structures na importante yung mapagtibay. Nagkaroon kami ng pagkakataon through PICE, through its conference, na magkaroon ng mga presentations sa mga talks para mas may paliwanag namin yung importansya ng ganitong mga technology or yung ASHER system. PDMP or yung PICE Disaster Management Program in response to the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction Management, PICE and OCD have a collaboration or a memorandum of agreement to address the preparedness, response, and mitigation of uh, the Philippines in terms of in disaster. We coordinate with the local government. We have teams. The PICE is spread out nationwide. We have more than 100 chapters, more than 10,000 members that can be tapped to respond upon the request of the LGUs. PICE as a professional organization of civil engineers play a huge role in the enforcement of the building code insofar as teaching and updating the civil engineers in the latest in design and construction methodologies. However, we cannot tell in the near future how a natural disaster might occur. Hence, the study further of earthquake engineering design is constantly evolving. Rest assured that uh, PICE will work on the development of these technologies with the help, of course, of civil engineering uh, schools, colleges, and other institutions. Vanguards of a Stronger Nation, the Philippine Institute of Civil Engineers has been involved in numerous community service efforts. True to their commitment to nation building, PICE has been the forefront of many goal-oriented projects that aim to significantly improve the lives of Filipinos. Ako po si Engineer Julito Hernandez, Civil Engineer. Ademar Pama, Civil Engineer. Frederick Sison, Civil Engineer. I am Dale Peral, I'm a Civil Engineer. I am Rebecca Husay Suela, I am Civil Engineer. I am Ana May Manias, Civil Engineer. I'm Dr. Francis Alvin Uy, and I am a civil engineer. I am Erd San Rene Suero, civil engineer. Here in PIC, we are at the service of every Filipino.
Good day to all the participants. It is with pleasure that we welcome everyone to this free webinar on geotechnical engineering hosted by the PACE National Board of Directors, spearheaded by the Interspecialty Group Committee through the Geotechnical Engineering Specialty Division. The PACE across the nation with 90 chapters set and more. Down the gullies, across the mountains, we engineers will blast and bore. With trucks and loaders, backhoes and dozers, no rockies can we stand our drive. With paint consultants, renowned constructors, all infrastructures are built right. We the civil engineers design and build. Design and build. We the civil engineers construct and build. Construct and build. Harder though the projects are, easier yet we treat by far with civil engineers in stride. We build stadiums and strong coliseums for all our people to computers with high-tech softwares we engineers always subscribe with BIC all civil engineers we want this earth we are most right Good afternoon and good evening to you all. Uh, we are here again. I think actually in this um, convention, itong seminar natin ato, if you would recall, when ECQ started last year. Ano? So this was uh, we, the ISG, the IC National to the ISG and the Specialty um, Divisions Committee uh, initiated this um, webinar series. Ano? So every, if you would recall, we had Every other week, meron po tayo mga free webinars. Ano. So since anniversary po ng ating uh, nitong pandemic, so we are again doing this uh, free webinar. Hopefully, we can continue again with the other specialty divisions. So right now po, uh, this webinar is uh, on the geotechnical engineering. Ano. So this is headed by our specialty division chair, Dr. Mark Zarco. So it's there. Uh, let me also... Uh, acknowledge the presence of some of our uh, panelists here. Uh, we have our director uh, and second DP. No? Uh, we have Sir, oh, no, sorry, sorry, our director, pala, sorry, Ber Sir Bernie de Guzman. Sir Bernardo de Guzman, ayan siya, nandiyan po siya. Our, we have, of course, our president. Uh, Sir Ernstan Renesuero is also here. Uh, you'll, you'll be seeing him in a bit. We have our past president, uh, Sir Jaime Pakanan. Good afternoon, sir. Um, we also have uh, from um, DWH, I think, is Sir Raul Asis, who's also here with us. Our past president, Sir Robert Lico. So he's also here. So good afternoon, po, sa inyong lahat. And of course, to our speakers. We will be presenting later. Marami, marami salamat po for for this uh, for sharing your time and your expertise and uh, for today, you know. So we have um, Dr. Alan Butoyan. Uh, we'll introduce later our speakers, uh, but I'd like to acknowledge them now. Dr. Alexis Acasio, uh, Engineer Jose Carlo Eric Santos, and Engineer Brian Tan. And we also have a member, actually, of our um, specialty division, Geotechnical Engineering Committee. Uh, we have Engineer Mark 
Morales, who's also here with us joining us. So good afternoon, po. And yun po, so again, uh, welcome po to our webinar, PIC webinar series. And this is actually brought to us with the, with the help of our sponsors. So without our sponsors, uh, this could not be possible. So I'd like also to acknowledge our sponsors. We have PGA Tech Group of Companies. Uh, we have Peter Ground Improvement Incorporated, PGA Earth Structure Solutions Incorporated, PGA GeoPR Philippines Incorporated, Philippine Geo Analytics Incorporated, AMH Philippines Incorporated, and Quality Solutions and Technologies Incorporated. So talagang on geotech talaga ang ating, ano, ang ating, ang ating seminar ngayon, complete with the mga geotechnical uh, sponsors natin. So, Again, so welcome to our uh, PIC webinar series on geotechnical engineering. And to give his, um, to give, uh, I'd like also to introduce now, I'd like to pass the, the video to our president for his uh, welcome remarks also. So let me call in our president, Dr. Erdsan Rene Suero. Thank you very much. Good day to all our uh, dear members in the country and abroad. On behalf of the PIC National Board of Directors, I would like to welcome and uh, congratulate you all. You are really very lucky to be among the 2,500 of the almost 100,000 members of PIC that would attend this webinar on geotechnical engineering this afternoon. Please uh, allow me to recognize the efforts of our interspecialty group committee headed by engineer Eric Sisson and the PIC specialty division on uh, geotechnical engineering chaired by uh, Dr. Mark uh, Sarko and the PIC national secretariat for coming up and uh, organizing this webinar. May uh, special thanks also to our resource speakers, Dr. Alan Butuyan, Dr. Alexis Philip Acasio, Engineer Roy Anthony Luna, and Engineer Brian Tan for sharing their valuable time and expertise. Yes, looking back on the past months, we're really into the most challenging and trying times. But with all of our determination, we've come to see great hopes and lights in PICE. And one of these is this webinar this afternoon on geotechnical engineering, a free online learning with free three CPD credit points for all those who will be uh, successful in completing this webinar. Actually, our secretariat reported to me that there were still uh, uh, more requests from our members for them to be accommodated on this webinar. But uh, we are really very sorry since the maximum limit of 2,500 participant slots were completely taken, which, uh, which just means that our civil engineers really wanted to learn more and to ensure their continuing professional development. Nevertheless, we still have our 2021 National Mid-Year Convention and Technical Conference next month. And uh, again, it's for free and more webinars in the near future. This is our way of thanking you all for your support and uh, cooperation to PIC Nationals programs and projects for our country and the profession at this time of the pandemic. Actually, all the PIC National uh, webinars and conventions uh, conducted last year in 2020 and up to next month will, will be for free no? or with no registration fee and hopefully up to the uh, year end. 
you know, my colleagues, I am really very happy with your shown remarkable interest and enthusiasm to attend all our offered online CPD programs. For I believe that we should really aspire to continually grow our knowledge, competencies, and qualifications as professionals. My fellow civil engineers, looking forward with the new program of the Professional Regulation Commission on Career Progression and Specialization, PICE remains committed to elevate Filipino civil engineers' professional standards even during this difficult time. That's why we are always reminding you to choose your career pathway, your specialization from our six fields of practice. The Professional Regulatory Board of Civil Engineering with PICE is now aggressively formulating the guidelines of the Career Progression and Specialization Program or the CPSP of our profession which will be uh, a part of our continuing professional development. Anytime soon, this program will be implemented to enhance recognition of Philippine professionals' qualifications, value, and comparability to support significantly the mobility of our Filipino civil engineers globally through mutually recognized qualifications. And we are challenged to be ready to level up through the CPD accredited programs like this webinar or any self-directed learning, formal or informal learning and other learning activities through our professional work experience. Anyway, don't worry. PIC will be here to support and guide you on this program. PICE, in collaboration with our uh, Professional Regulatory Board uh, of Civil Engineering, will still conduct orientation and capacity building activities related to the full implementation of our profession's career progression and specialization program to develop globally qualified and world-class Filipino civil engineers. Okay, that's uh, it about the CPD program. But before I end, may iba naman po tayo, no? I'd like to share with you a piece of advice which I believe some of you have heard me talk about this already. And I quote, try every day to learn something, to help someone, and to make the world a better place, And quote. I believe that if we can all use this as a guide, we will be doing something that is extraordinary for our society and for our own personal well-being and happiness. That's simple. That's simple. First, try every day to learn something in life, in your uh, workplace, in your community, new techniques, innovations, and from your daily experiences and learnings, just like uh, attending this webinar today. Second, try every day to help someone you know, every day we could really encounter people needing help. The simplest way is to lift up the spirits of others. A simple gesture of smile to express hope and joy. The need of someone to talk to, to share with anything, just like our resource speakers. They unselfishly share their precious time and knowledge and expertise. We can also do it. You know, there are so many different ways to help, and it feels really good to help, notwithstanding the thousand folds of blessings that would await you. And the last is, what do we mean by to make the world a better place? Actually, it's simple in our small way. I know that I'm now facing those PIC members who are bound to push that extra smile and mile to do good in this world. I'm facing those who are willing to uplift our field by rising to high standards, our practice, and our profession. In fact, this spirit alone would make the world a better place. So it's simple. Like I said, 
Let us always try every day to learn something, to help someone, and to make the world a better place. Again, thank you very much. Let us enjoy to receive all the learnings, the sharings this afternoon. And of course, start sharing also what you have, just like our resource speakers of this webinar, okay? Likewise, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to remind you of uh, the PIC Nationals Call for uh, volunteers as mentors of the PIC VISMA program or the PIC Virtual Internship of Students through Mentoring and Apprenticeship no? program and be a frontliner of the civil engineering education in the country during this time of pandemic. Yes, this is one noble way to heed my advice. Try every day to learn something to help our civil engineering students and to make the world a better place. Interested, contact your chapter or the PIC National. To end, again, 3H, let us always uh, be happy, be healthy, and be holy. Good day and God bless us all. Mabuhay ang PICE. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Sir Bong. Ano? So, uh, very umaga, relevant to speech you know, with this trying times. Tapos, thank you for the update, of course, on what the PICE is doing right now. So we have, again, as mentioned, we have the convention next, uh, next month, ano? the major convention, as well as the internship program or the VISMA program. So if anybody's interested, uh, please do reach us. And then, of course... Siyempre, akala ko makakalimutan ni President yung 3H niya. No? So, hindi, hindi kala ko na, na bago na yung kanyang ano, moto. Andun pa rin palang ang moto ni President, the 3H. Yan ang hindi natin makakalimutan kay Sir Bong. Uh, thank you again, Sir Bong. Also, I'd like to also acknowledge pala. No? I, I was able to miss, I, I missed out some of our panelists here. I'd like to acknowledge a member of, of the Geotechnical Specialty Division, uh, Sir Roy Luna is also here with us. And of course, our yung masipag natin Executive Director, Sir Ronnie Estores, who's also here with us, joining us in this uh, webinar and dito po siya sa panelist. And I also forgot to mention our one of one of our sponsors as well. So without our this sponsor, hindi po natin ma-increase yung ano yung yung particip yung ating ano no, yung slots for this webinar. So it was possible through our sponsor, Experto. That's why some of you are watching this webinar through the Experto platform, while some, yung initial lang, yung sa Zoom, and then the rest are all watching the Experto platform. So thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to our sponsor. I'd like to acknowledge again, Experto. Uh, most likely, they will also be the one for our national con for our national convention. Ano? So we try to get used to the ano, yung itsura niyan. So anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, before we proceed with our uh, lectures, uh, let me first give you the house rules. <clears throat> so, nakashare na ba siya? Ayan. So, house rules. Okay, so this webinar relies entirely on your internet, entirely on the internet connection and resources of your gadget. So, better to better, <clears throat> to better appreciate and Experience the presentation. It is advised that you close all other applications and limit bandwidth sharing in your workplace or household while the webinar is ongoing. For those in the Zoom, uh, the microphone of all the attendees shall be muted to avoid unnecessary noise, noise and, and not disturb both the presenter and all the other attendees. The attendees can only hear and view both the presenter and the panelists. Participants who are in the Zoom hall shall send their questions to the Q&A button. So dun sa baba, I think siguro after one year of using uh, online platforms, I think we're very familiar already on <laughs> yung mga chat box. Ano. So just type in your questions dun sa chat box, sa Zoom, and both the experto, there's a chat box there. So type in your questions there. So even, even while the presentation is ongoing, kung may maisip na po kayong questions, just type it. And then we have our panelists and we have our secretariat monitoring 
those questions. Para after the presentation, we will screen a few questions to ask our present uh, our speakers. Ano, and if in case your questions were not addressed, or if you have any other questions, um, just email it also to Ginon. rubyruth.pice at gmail.com so we can forward it to our speakers as well. Uh, next is, so although this is a free webinar, o dahil ba free webinar to, meron tayong may exam. Dahil actually yung dalawang speakers dyan, tsaka yung moderator, professor ko nung college, kaya may exam, may exam daw. No? <laughs> so it's just after the, after the, after the Q&A, uh, we will be posting a link It's a Google form. It's it's just a simple question regarding the topic as well as uh, a poll on the speaker. So, po ano lang siya, evaluation assessment. But make sure that you answer the question and you answer the poll because this will be your attendance for the uh, lecture. And uh, without that, we will tally. We will um, check those to see if you have answered those questions para mabigyan kayo ng certificate later on, the certificate of participation. So make sure that you answer the questions and the poll uh, right after the Q&A. Ilalabas po again dyan sa chat box. So abangan nyo yun para masagutan nyo. And lastly, the, again, the certificate, same as with our, our other uh, webinars, the certificates will be uh, uploaded in the membership portal. So once there, the once the certificates are available, we will inform you. So you can just log into your um, your account in the PICE membership portal to download the to download the certificate. So those who are watching that are not yet members, so make sure to register in the membership portal. Okay, so that's it for our house rules. So yung uh, ano patagalin simula na natin, and uh, I'd like to introduce to you my professor. in uh, BSCE and MS. Uh, he is the chair of the specialty division in geotechnical engineering and a professor in the Institute of Civil Engineering, University of the Philippines. Uh, let's give a warm welcome to our moderator, uh, Dr. Mark Albert Zarco. Okay, good afternoon and thank you very much, Eric. So the uh, geotechnical specialty division of PICE has uh, lined up for distinguished speakers for this special webinar uh, devoted solely to geotechnical engineering. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker who is Alan Batoyan. He has a doctor of engineering uh, from uh, uh, Mindanao, I think State University and IIT uh, in, uh, in uh, geotechnical engineering. And he is also uh, currently the president and CEO of QSTI, um, Quality Test Solutions and Technologies, as well as also, um, I think, uh, let me look at the, uh, I know two other companies. So AE Botoyan Construction and Structural Uh, consultancy as well as Concrete Tech Incorporated. And he will be talking about uh, the testing, uh, pull-out tests for uh, geosynthetic uh, uh, walls uh, or mechanically stabilized uh, earth walls uh, which are submerged. So I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Alan Botoyan. Uh, okay. Ayan. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Mark, and to the very committed uh, PICE National Directorate. It is really a privilege for me to share and talk about uh, this topic this afternoon. So let me now uh, share my uh, PowerPoint. I think I'm still disabled to share my screen. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, it's still disabled. Secretariat, please. Uh, please. Uh, while we are having some technical difficulties, ayan. Okay, I'm I'm in. Okay. 
So I hope I am now in. Yes, sir, we can see your presentation already. Okay. There. So can you see the, the screen already? Okay, I hope I am in the screen. Okay, good afternoon once again. So again, my topic for this afternoon is laboratory pullout test of geograde reinforcements. And this is specifically for submerged mechanically stabilized earth for waterfront applications. And let me extend that further for other MSEs that are experiencing some partial to full submergence. Okay, so basically, what is a what is a mechanically stabilized Earth? And since I've heard that there are two thousand five hundred civil engineers who registered in this Zoom link, so let me just give us a little background. So in college, we were able to understand basic retaining wall structures for the purpose of retaining any soil and. A mechanically stabilized structure is basically a reinforced soil with some components. The soil being reinforced will also become a retaining wall to retain a soil. So if this is our structure, the basic components of a mechanically stabilized earth is a reinforced soil. So the soil is being reinforced by geogrids in this uh, presentation and there is a facing to make it vertical and the entire combination or composite will be talk, will be retaining a structure and the reinforced soil and retained soil will be resting on a foundation and the facing will also be resting on a leveling pad. So basically these are the components of an MSE wall with some drainage uh, requirements but we will not be discussing that in this afternoon. So some examples here, this is a, the ongoing and uh, roughly finished uh, double coastal road, which we did. And this is a 300 meters on both sides of an MSE wall in double coastal road. And we use the patented modular segmental block produced also by our company, the Concretech, and we use the geogrids for this structure. And this is also a part of that as shown being constructed in the early stages before the pandemic hit Davao. And this is now almost done uh, a few months ago. So basically, if this is our, this is our MSE wall, when it is acting as a retaining wall, and when it is loaded with some surcharge or some vehicular load, there will be some equivalent forces, okay? Uh, lateral pressure and then the surcharge equivalent load and then the combined load, it will, it will give us a different load that will be acting on the retaining wall. Now for this to be designed, we have to determine what are the external and the internal stability of the structure? So first, if we have a lateral force, there will be a sliding failure. And another one is there can be an overturning failure. And as in any retaining wall structure, there can also be a bearing failure. And finally, we also check that on the global stability failure. So that is for external stability of the structure. So, but we will be focusing so much on the internal stability of the structure. So if it is an internal stability, we are simply talking of on the retaining wall itself, not the retained soil. So if this is our structure, so there is what we call a failure plane which will tend to slide downwards this failure zone and the, the 
the dew grid or the soil reinforcement will be cut through and what is on the other side is the anchorage zone. So when this slides down, all of this reinforcement will experience some tension. And this tension will be divided into two kinds of tension, the rupturing tension and the pulling out tension. So if this block of mass will go down, okay, all of this reinforcement will experience tension and the bottom part, because it is deeply embedded, will not be pulled out, but will experience some rupturing. Okay, so it will be uh, represented by those arrows that were cut. And on the upper portion of the slide failure, since you have lesser embedment depth, there is a tendency that the geogrids will be pulled out towards that face because of that sliding failure. Okay, so looking now on the internal stability so that we'll be able to understand further on how the test is conducted, we have to look at a single geogrid, which is a depth of Z from the top. And if this is now going to be LR, the depth of uh, the failure zone and the embedment depth of LE, okay, with a vertical spacing of SV. So if we will try to look at the tributary zone, which is colored in violet, and we consider that tension on that uh, geogrid and then zooming it out, this is the pressure or this is going to be the tension applied on the geogrid. And the force that is being applied there because of that sliding is basically the uh, horizontal stress multiplied by the spacing times the factor of safety or the lateral earth pressure. So with those force, okay, the tensile failure, we will not be talking much today because it is basically generic to the material or the strength as the geogrid is defined by the supplier. So that's the tensile failure, meaning it will snap or it will rupture at the face of the failure plane. And using that same formula, we only need to have a factor of safety against rupture, given the allowable stress, allowable force divided by the maximum force. Now we will focus on the pullout failure, which is really the anchorage of the remainder of, or the embedded dew grid is going to be pulled out. So that picture showed there that the grid does not rupture, but it's going to be pulled out from its embedment. And using that same force, so the pull out is basically uh, the factor of safety is what is the allowed force and then divided by that uh, applied force. Now, zooming it out again, so we have this formula, so or this is now the equation, that means you have two meaning two phases, then the length of embedment, LE, then the overburden pressure multiplied by the tangent of the interface friction between the dew grid and the soil. Now we have to convert instead of determining the dew grid interface with the soil, we use the soil directly by multiplying a certain factor, which is CI, which is what we now call from here on the coefficient of interaction. Okay, So this is where we will focus on how to get this. Now, basically, this is uh, on many software in MSE design. This is all given from a drain condition, meaning the structure is not submerged. And when it is not submerged, when it experiences some submergence, we just directly apply the effective stress concept. But uh, based on the research, we have to understand that since effective stress concept is a theory, we will check it in reality, whether the effective stress concept is basically valid on very, very low effective overburden pressures. So this is now the focus of the study. So the, the coefficient of interaction is basically following this equation. Okay, the shear stress on the dew grid divided by the soil resistance. Okay, in other words, in simple terms, the apparent pullout resistance when you pull the dew grid 
and you divide it by the resistance of the soil to soil interaction, you get the coefficient of interaction. Okay, so the numerator is taken from the laboratory pullout test, and the denominator is also taken from a direct shear test from the laboratory. So we call that the apparent pullout resistance over the soil resistance or shear resistance. So if we have now here a basic uh, graph, uh, effective overburden pressure before uh, uh, versus shear stress. So if this is now the numerator, that's the uh, strength envelope of the dew grid reacting with the soil. And then this is now the strength envelope of the soil. So for any given uh, pressure or vertical pressure, we have an equivalent shear stress and also an equivalent shear stress on these two. So when we divide these two, we get the interaction uh, coefficient. Okay, so basically this is our equation. And there is also another equation that is uh, used today, which is very popular, the pullout resistance by the AASTO simplified method. And that is basically the equation. And they are almost the same. But we will not be talking about that. If I'll be given another opportunity, we can uh, discuss this in future webinars. But as this afternoon, we will only talk about the derivation of the angle of the coefficient of interaction CI based on this equation. So why do we do this uh, considering uh, submerged uh, MSE walls? Okay, MSE retaining walls are not always drained or non-submerged. The reason is sometimes they are fully or partially drained or submerged after project completion. So this is uh, one of the projects we did in somewhere in Davo del Norte, a canal that is about 2.5 meters wide and this is about two meters deep. So during heavy downpour, this MSE, when the water will rise, will cause the geogrids or the soil reinforcement be submerged. So it is the intent of this uh, construction to use this as a canal. Therefore, a portion of this will be fully submerged. And we have also did this um, MSE wall, which is uh, resting on a geotube. Okay? The, the water level during uh, heavy monsoon will also rise up and down and considering the tidal changes. So this MSE wall on one of the container uh, areas in Davao will experience partial submergence. And this is also one of the uh, river bank protection uh, beside our river here. And it is uh, constructed with MSE, even this uh, gabion walls, this is also reinforced with geo grids. So not only the modular segmental block at the top, but from the bottom going up is also reinforced. And this is submerged during uh, December to about early part of February. So another one is partially submerged during construction due to nonstop heavy downpour. So even if the structure is not uh, designed to be exposed to water, but during the construction, just like this tagon flyover that is still ongoing, uh, this is uh, experiencing, especially during the Crescent Typhoon. So this is uh, submerged or the, the reinforced soil is always wet during that time and water sometimes clog at the top, then of course, the MSE will always be submerged at times. So what are the laboratory tests required in order to get the coefficient of interaction? So once one of the equipment we need is to make a large pull-out test equipment. So the AI, uh, the ASCE suggested that the required dimension should be at least 600 in width and uh, about 500 in length, uh, in height and about 800 in uh, length. 
So another one is we have to make a large direct shear test equipment of about the same dimension. So since we will be pulling out a dew grid, so we have uh, made this uh, in, in my research. So I put up this equipment, the schematic diagram of the pull out assembly. So you will notice here, this is the entire box. At the center, we have two chambers. We have the soil chamber and the other one is the water chamber. And then this is the pull out system. And there are two uh, pore pressure transducers to measure the water pressure outside and to measure also the pore pressure on the other side and make them equal before pull out is needed. And to simulate the overburden pressure, we have an air bag at the top, rubberized air bag which will be filled with air. And there is a, an air pressure regulator to uh, consider or to target that kind of pressure. And to produce the pressure, the water pump is located outside with a water tank in order to supply water on the water chamber and then it goes through the other side. And to pull this in a constant strain, very, very slow, it's uh, pulled like one mm per minute to 10 mm per minute. So that's the speed that we have to control using an electric motor control. And to get those measurements, we have a data logger connected to a computer for storage and program. So we made some uh, programming here and to read everything. So all of these dew grids are connected at different points. So we have five locations for the dew grid to read at the same time simultaneously together with all the pressure readings. And also at the front, there is also a linear variable displacement transformer to measure the movement of the pullout system. So we made this. And this is now the machine beside our laboratory. So you will see here the scale model, the technician is there. And on the lower right corner, you have the LVDT to measure the displacement at every location of the dew grid. Okay, and we have a servo controller to uh, control the rotation and convert that rotation to speed of pullout. And we have this uh, component. So we have the 12 Newton meter torque servo motor, and it is connected to a one is to 30 gearbox reducer because it's really very, very slow due to the drained and undrained loading condition. And it is connected to a 15 ton warm gear screw to convert the rotation to a very, very slow pull. And to, to measure the forces applied on the dew grid, we have a 15 ton electronic load cell. And we have a 10 meter head capacity water pump to generate water pressure and the pore pressure. And while we are filling, we need to see the pressure for the soil and the water chamber that they should be equal. Initially, the water pressure will always be high. And after two to three hours, the soil pressure will start now to equalize with the water chamber pressure. And when we will now measure electronically, we put a pressure transducer for this water chamber and also the pore pressure. And at the back, we convert the uh, 0 to 20 milliamps of potentiometer with 150 mm displacement capacity of the LVDD to measure the movement of the dew grid or the stretching. And here is also the pressure design of the airbags. First, the water or the, the air will enter and then we let it pass through a pressure regulator. So we determine what is the input pressure and then when it is controlled, like for example, a 20 kPa uh, pressure, it will now enter inside the airbag. And then when it goes out, we have a pressure transducer and we have 
regulated output pressure. So both going in and going out will be able to control so that the pressure is constant. And with all of this, we have uh, hired a computer engineer and electronics engineer to design the data acquisition system. And we use the national instruments and love you software to determine simultaneous real-time reading. So this is now the uh, graphical user interface of the machine. And we have here six linear variable transducers for different locations. And we have those readings. And we have also the load cell reading, temperature, water pressure, pore pressure, and overburden pressure. So we read them every two second interval. So this is how the uh, conduct of the pull out test is given. So this is about 1.5 meters long. The length is 1.5 and the width is 680 and the water chamber is 700. So this is about 680 and above here is the place for the water. So what we will do first is we put we put the soil, okay, the air pressure and the overburden pressure. And if it is drain condition, meaning there is no water, the soil is dry, then we will now start to pull the dew grid while it is being pressed by a simulated overburden pressure. And after that, we now get the pull-out resistance of a non-submerged. And the same process will be done when we submerge everything. So we put water, we target a certain water pressure on one side and make sure and ensure that the uh, water pore pressure of the soil will be equal to the water chamber pressure. So it will go under this zone that is, you have seen those rods underneath and then it goes up. Okay, and then once the pore pressure and water pressure has now uh, been made equal, then the slow pull will be applied until we have reached those curves. So we thank one of the sponsors for this research is uh, FW Nicole. They gave us plenty of Tensar RE580, which we use in the test. And also the other one is Tenkate or Arizona Geosynthetics, the Tenkate Meregrid uh, GX6030. So we have two components. And in the Tensar RE580 and GX6030, so these are the pull-out table. So we have CGS, which stands for coarse grain soil, which are sandy and... Uh, usually uh, common in places. And then we conducted a non-submerged or drain condition without water with different normal pressure from 20, 40, and 62. And the pore pressures here, you will notice they are zero. And the same combination, we have three tests also. We have the Tensar RE580 and coarse grain soil, which is also submerged. So the normal pressure Pressures are the same, but now we we impute a different pore pressure. So 20 is now given a pore pressure of 14, 41 is 24, 62, and 34. So there will be a difference of these two. But on top of the tensor, we also use coarse grain soils with Tenkate Miragrid 6030 and use the same setup. So we have normal pressure without uh, pore pressure, without submergence, and we submerge the same with values. And use also a fine grain soil. Now, what are fine grain soils? These are uh, usually made of clays and silts when there are no available coarse grain soil in the area. So this is fine grain soil. And then we use, again, the same setup non-submerged and submerged. And at the same time, we did the same thing on Tenkate with uh, fine grain soil with different uh, 
normal pressure, submerged and non-submerged. So all in all, uh, without considering all those repeat tests, uh, the minimum test we did is 24 tests or 24 sample tests. Okay, so for the non-submerged condition, we'll just have this one example. We will not go through all of them. So this is uh, coarse grain with tensor RE 550, and that is drained, meaning there's no water. So if that is now for a 20 kilopascal pressure, so the maximum pull-out force is when the curve starts to plateau. And also for the 40 kPa, the violet one, okay, and finally the 60 kPa. So once we have those pull-out force, we convert that to shear stresses by dividing it with the area. So we have now the shear stress, those points now for a 20 kPa, that's not the shear stress equivalent, and that's the shear stress equivalent. Then by regression analysis, we were able to determine the uh, strength envelope with that equation. And from that line, we'll, we'll be able to determine the apparent cohesion and the apparent uh, friction angle between the geo grid tensor RE 580 and the, the soil which is coarse grain. And from there, we'll be able to get those angles and the cohesion value. So for the submerged condition, it's just the same. So we did uh, 60 kilopascal overburden, and we have now introduced a pore pressure or water pressure inside the chamber of 14 kPa, giving us a difference of uh, 6 kilopascal or what you call the what's called the equivalent overburden pressure. So again, 40 kPa, we put 24 kilopascal pore pressure, difference of 16 kPa, and another test, 60 kPa, a 60, and then 33, and finally 103 and 35 pp or pore pressure. So in short, this is now the value of the comparison between submerged and non-submerged condition. And we will see some findings. So looking at this thing, we just did the same thing in order to determine the apparent cohesion and apparent in, uh, friction between the dew grid and the soil. So we have here the regression equation to get the angle or the friction angle and the intercept. So now if we try to look at this example, so if this is now the submerged CGS or the non-submerged CGS, and that is now the submerged CGS of the tensor versus the coarse grain uh, soil, we will notice that the non-submerged has a higher value of CA. If you try to look at this, if you will extend this yellow line, it will intersect the vertical axis higher than the intersection of the submerged CGS. So that's the curve. And also for tensor compared with or interface with fine grain soil, so this is the non-submerged. So you will notice that this red line will be intersecting higher, so it will have a higher cohesion value. And when it is submerged, we notice that the cohesion will also reduce, okay? but the angle will also reduce. So that's now the picture that I have shown with some live animation. So without going through the Tenkate, so this is now the picture of Tenkate GX60 and uh, coarse grain soil and the fine grain soil. So you will notice that the friction angle does not change that much. Only the cohesion value changes so between the coarse grain and the dew grid. So summary of strength envelope. So when we talk about tensor RE580, you will notice that the angle, the friction angle will increase, but the intercept will decrease. So same with the friction at uh, the fine grain soil with tensor. So this is the uh, tabulation of the figure that I have shown just a while ago. Okay, so 
Let's now go to the direct shear test because we already know the line, the strength and below between a soil and the dew grid. So what we need to do now is what is or what are the values, the strength envelopes of the soil that we use to interface with the dew grid. So again, uh, we built another uh, large direct shear box. So if this, what happened? Oh. Sorry, there should be a drawing here. So something went wrong. So this is I'll, I'll open one file just I'll just go here. Okay, sorry for that. So this is now the direct shear box. So this is the containment of the soil. So on the side view, we have this uh, filled with soil and then filled it again with soil. Of course, they compact it. And then we filled it with or we cover it with the chamber of air, then pump the same pressure, then push it so that this will shear off on a given plane. So we will be able to determine the cohesion and uh, friction angle. So this is now the picture of the direct, large direct shear box, okay? Connected also to the same data acquisition system. So once we have uh, determined the values of the uh, strength parameters will be able now to determine the strength. So we have the same values. Okay, we have the servo motor control, air pressure gauge, and this is now the shear stress strain of the soil. So we have a coarse grain soil, the coarse grain soil. So we first use the 20 kilopascal overburden pressure, and that is now the curve and we look at the starting point of the plateau for the shear stress and we use again another pressure 40 kPa so just imagine uh, it's difficult to assemble then test then remove again then replace with a new one so it will take at least one or two days to conduct one experiment and we have finally the 72 kilopascal load and we have now this curve so converting that into a strength envelope, and then the angle is 38.1 and the intercept is zero. So when we have these two lines, all we need to do now is just compare the two and divide, we get the interaction component. So again, this is for the fine grain soil because we have two types of soil, the coarse grain and the fine grain. Now, just an aside, we know that coarse grain soil will always be uh, not available in construction sites. And basically, we need to determine what are the uh, soil parameters on the area that is nearest supply or quarry site to the construction site so that the cost of the material will not be too prohibitive. So this is the reason why we need to determine the strength parameters of the soil that will be interfacing with the geo grid. So in this case, we now have these three curves, then convert it to a strength envelope to determine the friction and cohesion values. So once we have that, so the coefficient of interaction will simply be the apparent pull-out resistance divided by the shear resistance of soil. So interfacing on top and soil to soil below. So if we have now this table, we have the setup, coarse grain soil versus a tensor RE580. We have the apparent cohesion, the apparent cohesion, then effective strength. And then when we compute these values, we will get the actual shear strength. And following this equation, the actual shear strength, and then 
divided by the shear strength of the soil, we get 1.19. Okay, and the rest will do the same, will go through the same process. So th these are 24 tests. So we have now this very nice curve. So sometimes in, in the design of MSE structures, we always uh, input the CI value or the CDS value for these things. But uh, when we investigated the effect of submergence, we will notice that the upper curve, which is the non-submerged condition are higher compared to the same setup with uh, when they are submerged. So you will notice that 1.19 here will become lower. And to look at this one, from zero to 60, there is a difference, but above 60, the values will now be the same, whether they are submerged or non-submerged. So the difference is from 37% to 2% reduction. So same with the fine grain soil using tensor. So there is again a reduction. So usually the values are from 0.83 to 0.55 as you increase the, the overburden pressure and it will now go to a straight line. But when it is submerged, it's again reduced, especially at very low overburden pressures and that is from 43 to 2%. So looking at this interaction coefficients, I'll put it here. Okay, the Tenkate and these values. So we have now the Tenkate with uh, coarse grain and fine grain. So the green one is for the uh, coarse grain and the violet one is for the uh, submerged, uh, what you call this, the fine grain condition. So the values are now lower. So what can we conclude from here? So from this uh, presentation, we can say that the reduction, there is a reduction in the uh, CI values when MSE structures are submerged, even when using coarse grain soils, especially at lower effective overburden pressure. All, all the CI values reduce from drain to undrained condition. Okay, based on this uh, experiment, we have a 37% reduction for the fine grains uh, versus tensor. There is a 43% reduction. For coarse grain versus tenkate, 14%. And fine grain versus tenkate, we have 22%. So these are the observations. So what is the implication of this? So understanding that the MSE structures are at times submerged, either fully or partially, then there has to be some adjustments necessary to uh, impute on the coefficient of interactions. So equation, so because of this research, we are now having a value by regression analysis to have the uh, coefficient of interaction for drain condition and undrained condition for tensor versus coarse grain soil and fine grain soil versus tensor. So if we have this equation, we'll be able now to, to use this to determine what are the uh, coefficient of interactions. Now, this is not really so much of a problem or a concern if the pressure or the overburden pressure is high, especially those at the lower level of the MSE. But as you go higher nearing the surface or the end termination of the top of the MSE structure where the overburden pressure is low, and then when it will be submerged, then definitely uh, some adjustment needs to be uh, made. So we have also here for the Tenkate and versus coarse grain soil and fine grain soil. So for that, thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, Dr. Mark, I'm giving you now the, yeah, okay. uh, the room.
Okay, so um, uh, I noticed in the question and answer box, there are no questions yet that are posted. So let's do it this way. Let's just have all four presentations first, and then maybe that will be time for our participants to think of their questions. So let's have it after all the uh, presentations have been uh, given. Okay, so we'll proceed to the next speaker, who is a colleague of mine from uh, the Institute of Civil Engineering, specifically from the Geotechnical Engineering Group of uh, the Institute of Civil Engineering in UPD Liman. He's uh, uh, Dr. Alexis Philip Acasio, and he will be talking about uh, liquefaction, which is basically his uh, current uh, and uh, which he is well known for. So it will. Uh, the, the title of his lecture will be on mitigating liquefaction hazards in residential uh, subdivisions. So he's uh, spoken about this in previous uh, webinars, and I invited him uh, for the benefit of uh, PICE to speak about this topic because it's very, uh, there's so much interest in it. So I'd like to give the floor to uh, Dr. Akasha. Uh, okay, uh, good afternoon and good morning to, uh, to everyone. Uh, this is my, uh, my uh, presentation and uh, thank you PIC for inviting me. I'd like to, uh, to, uh, to uh, share this with my uh, uh, two research uh, 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 group members, Trisha De La Cruz and uh, Monica Ledesma. And uh, of course, uh, just a quick outline on uh, my uh, presentation uh, today. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction of liquefaction, uh, why we're doing this study. We have a case study uh, about uh, the Gupan City. I'll uh, talk a little bit about seismic uh, hazards. Uh, and then I'll present a, a simple methodology of uh, liquefaction assessment, of course, uh, with uh, the development of uh, very fast computing software, we are already using a lot of software. And then I'll just show you the results of our tests and I'll share with you the uh, methods uh, and damage uh, mitigation. Uh, soil liquefaction is a uh, phenomena in which uh, uh, saturated and loose uh, medium to fine grained soils uh, loses its strength uh, during an earthquake. Uh, here, the soil has to be, uh, has to be uh, cohesionless, and we all know that. Uh, the picture on the uh, right, uh, of course, it's a 1990 uh, picture. We all know that we had a big earthquake, uh, July uh, 16, uh, 1990, and then the Gupan City was uh, badly damaged uh, due to uh, liquefaction. So basically, uh, the soil loses its strength uh, during an earthquake, and... Uh, uh, it only happens uh, for uh, saturated, loose, and, 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 uh, and cohesionless uh, soil. So what happens if, uh, if uh, uh, there is liquefaction? Number one, uh, there's a distortion of uh, the uh, structure uh, due to the settlement of the ground, uh, loss of uh, foundation uh, bearing capacity, and of course, uh, displacement of foundation and connections in between uh, adjacent uh, buildings like uh, water lines are sheared off, uh, drainage, drainage lines are, are uh, sheared off. So if you, look, uh, if you wanna look at the theory a little bit, uh, of course, we know the uh, basic uh, effective stress uh, formula. Effective stress is equal to total stress minus uh, hydrostatic stress or pore water pressure the phenomena of liquefaction simply is the increase in uh, pore water pressure. If the pore water pressure increases so much, then the effective stress uh, basically reduces down to, uh, goes down to, uh, to uh, zero. I, uh, these are just uh, pictures of uh, the liquefaction uh, phenomena. I, I picked up some pictures from abroad and then I'll move on to the local uh, pictures uh, that we have. Uh, here, uh, due to the to liquefaction, this uh, fine grain sand uh, by means of sand boil simply goes up into the ground. And it go, when it goes up into the ground during the process of liquefaction, effective stress is practically zero. 
I'm using practically zero because there's a small bit of residual strength uh, that is left during uh, liquefaction, but that residual strength cannot possibly uh, support the, uh, the, uh, the structure. Uh, here, these are uh, sand boils. And on, on your right, uh, we have also the uplift of uh, underground uh, buried structures. Uh, these underground buried, buried structures are practically empty. And when there's an increase in pore water pressure from, uh, from below, uh, this will all be uh, lifted up. A uh, very common uh, effect also is that the underground the gasoline and fuel tanks of gas stations also get uh, lifted up. And of course, there is some embankment uh, spread uh, here. Uh, the embankments, uh, of course, uh, since there is lack of uh, lateral uh, confinement, uh, the tendency of this embankment is to spread uh, towards uh, the, uh, the side. Uh, of course, uh, we also experience liquefaction. Uh, well, this is a picture from the uh, Bohol earthquake. This is a phenomena called the uh, lateral uh, spread. We have here a uh, damaged, uh, damaged uh, pavement, uh, liquefaction induced uh, also. And these are uh, pictures from the 1990 Luzon earthquake. Uh, it will, uh, in July, that will be uh, 31 years. And uh, when, when the earthquake happened, uh, the, the Gupan city was uh, put in the spotlight because it's a highly urbanized city, a lot of uh, three or four story buildings. Uh, it's, it's, it's in the CBD or the central uh, business district. Uh, that's why uh, it's, uh, it, it became practically a research ground for uh, several uh, uh, several years, but take note that uh, when we were doing uh, back then, uh, when when we were doing uh, field work, uh, liquefaction was also observed in the towns of uh, Herona Tarlac, and there's this town also in La Union called uh, Barangay Alaska, and in in Aringay, uh, liquefaction was very uh, very pronounced. However, uh, it was not uh, practically populated. That's why it didn't get the uh, spotlight in terms of the uh, of the news. Uh, I got these pictures from my uh, colleague, uh, former classmate, together with Dr. Sarko, uh, Roli Orense. Uh, these are uh, this, uh, the one on the, uh, on the left uh, are pictures from abroad, but the one in the middle on, uh, and uh, to your right, these are uh, pictures uh, uh, in uh, the Gupan uh, city. Uh, if you can, if you look at the date in there, 1990, August 31, the earthquake uh, happened uh, July 16. So it was about uh, 45 days after the, uh, the earthquake. And if you look at the uh, building uh, to your right, because of the eccentric weight of the building, it uh, practically has, uh, has uh, tilted. This is the, uh, the Magsaysay Bridge in, uh, in the Gupan uh, city that, uh, that uh, collapsed. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the water, it was rainy season, uh, that was uh, July, and of course the road was also uh, uh, flooded uh, for two reasons. It was, it was the rainy season, that, that I think that's a major reason, and the other reason was that the ground was already uh, submerged. Uh, I, uh, these are my uh, personal pictures, I, I took this. Uh, during the, uh, when we were doing a lot of reconnaissance work uh, in there. Uh, this is your liquefied, uh, liquefied uh, sand that simply came out uh, of the, of the uh, ground. So uh, why, why, why the Gupan? Uh, because wh what are we trying to, uh, to do in this uh, research? Uh, we are trying to, uh, to, uh, to suggest ways on how to improve ground on uh, liquefiable uh, soil. So we, let's look at the Gupan first because it's a very good case study. Uh, we, we, we can learn a lot from uh, the borehole data from the Gupan city, how to assess liquefiable soil. And then towards uh, and, and the, uh, and the end, uh, towards the end of uh, my presentation today, we will try to look at uh, ways on how to improve uh, potentially liquefiable ground and, you know, uh, try to minimize the risk with special focus on subdivisions, 
and uh, you know horizontal uh, horizontal uh, development. So if you look at uh, from from the uh, from the air, uh, if you look at uh, the Gupan, uh, it's really filled with meandering with meandering rivers. It's relatively flat, uh, full of uh, fish ponds, and of course, uh, plus the loose uh, cohesionless soil uh, on, on on the uh, or within the area, so a very high potential for uh, liquefaction. This is now the uh, repair, the repaired uh, Magsaysay uh, bridge. I showed the picture a while ago. It was damaged, and I think uh, the 1990 earthquake started the board pile uh, revolution in the in the Philippines. We all we, we always had uh, driven piles, but engineers then. Uh, realized that uh, we need uh, stronger structures, we need uh, better foundations, we need we needed higher capacity uh, piles. So here they, it started basically the uh, the board pile uh, revolution in the uh, in the Philippines. This is a picture of uh, the Gupan. If you if you see if you if you uh, imagine well, this is on the other side of the Gupan, but you can easily imagine uh, that. Uh, the Gupan a hundred years ago looked like this, and then as uh, the uh, as the city progressed, uh, formerly fish ponds they they started to backfill, and started to build their structures. So the the first step in assessing the liquefaction susceptibility of an area is of course look at the geologic setting of the area. If we have a lot of uh, meandering river channels and streams especially of uh, if you have low velocity uh, rivers then of course the position the, the water flow is slow if the water flow is slow uh, soft deposits will be placed in there therefore it's uh, it's uh, the perfect uh, type of soil that can liquefy during an uh, during an earthquake seismicity of the gupan uh, of course uh, uh, during uh, during the last 1990 earthquake uh, the the main fault was the dig dig uh, fault about 56 kilometers from uh, from uh, the Gupan uh, city. So at this year uh, we know the where the earthquake uh, generator uh, is. Uh, of course, uh, if you go back to the uh, regional uh, geology of the Gupan, if you look at the uh, geologic map in here, consists of uh, quarter. Uh, uh, quaternary uh, deposits, uh, alluvial deposits, uh, deposited uh, by uh, by water, very uh, soft uh, sediments. So, what is the objective of this uh, research? Uh, of course, uh, what we are trying to do here is to first uh, identify uh, potentially liquefiable regions. Then, uh, it's a straightforward analysis. We uh, we simply compute for the uh, factor of safety. And if the factor of safety is uh, less than one, therefore there's a risk uh, against uh, liquefaction. And of course, uh, if the factor of safety is uh, greater than one, then more or less we are safe uh, against uh, liquefaction. And again, uh, going back to the study area, uh, I had a similar uh, slide uh, a while ago. And uh, again, uh, same picture, just to emphasize the liquefiable soil in uh, the Gupan, and some uh, pictures also. This was uh, the this this was a paper uh, that uh, I wrote together with uh, Professor Ishihara and Professor uh, Tuhata uh, two years, uh, three years after the earthquake. This is a soils and foundations uh, paper, which uh, we we detailed the the area of uh, of uh, the Gupan on the on the. Uh, uh, on the liquefiable ground. And what we found out, uh, number one, was that, uh, of course, structures near the river channels not only settled vertically, but also translated laterally. So we, we, have, a, we, have, we have the basic idea that during liquefaction, the ground would settle. But again, we should also consider the lateral movement of uh, structures during the liquefaction, which I will show you a simple uh, analysis uh, later. And again, uh, ground subsidence in the roads of uh, the Gupan uh, city. So in liquefaction, in liquefaction analysis, uh, it's a simple process 
of uh, calculating the uh, the FS or the uh, factor of safety. Factor of of safety is uh, simply the cyclic uh, resistance ratio or over the cyclic stress uh, ratio. Meaning to say, uh, the numerator is the resistance of the ground and the denominator is the developed stresses. We calculate the uh, cyclic uh, stress ratio given by this uh, formula, uh, given by uh, seed. And uh, step two, we, uh, we uh, look at the uh, uncorrected SPT and blow counts. Uh, well, towards the end of this slide, so we have a, a table on what all of this uh, uh, means. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll share my presentation with you, so don't don't uh, don't worry. After this, I'll send it to the PIC office so that the PIC office can can send it uh, to you. So the uh, uncorrected SPT uh, blow count uh, is uh, influenced by many factors, uh, uh, many factors uh, in here. And of course, there's a fine content uh, correction uh, based on the uh, seed and Indri's uh, method. Let's, uh, let's pay particular uh, attention to this uh, fine content correction because it gives us an idea on the effect of uh, fine content uh, with regards to uh, liquefaction uh, susceptibility. So if you look at uh, the, if, if your fine content is less than or equal to a 5%, so of course, fine content is simply the, the amount of fines passing sieve number uh, 200. And of course, uh, these are your silts and your uh, clays. So if your fine content is less than or equal to 5%, our alpha is zero, our beta is one. So if alpha is zero, beta is one. So practically you, you just have your N value uh, the same. Okay, uh, the, you, you, uh, it's, it's the same N values, but look at the extreme. If the fine content is greater than 35%, meaning to say there's enough clay, there's enough silt within our soil mass, what happens to alpha? Alpha now becomes five and beta becomes 1.2. So this becomes a higher value of an equivalent N value. It simply means that uh, the more uh, fines you have, the lower uh, the susceptibility of your soil to, uh, to liquefaction. And of course, uh, research and uh, field records have shown that if you are within the range of a fine content of greater than 35 or even greater than 30, there's a small chance that your soil will liquefy during earthquake. But of course, you still would have to calculate for the settlement effects uh, during an, uh, an earthquake. And of course, uh, and we also have here the cyclic uh, resistance ratio, uh, simple, uh, uh, quick uh, formula. Then of course, we have to calculate now the, uh, the overburden stress, we have to correct it. And of course, we have to uh, uh, correct uh, the uh, cyclic resistance ba based on the magnitude of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, earthquake. And finally, this is where we, uh, we end up. Uh, factor of safety, again, is simply the ratio of the resistance being over offered by the soil that you have divided by the developed shear stresses during an earthquake. And our objective here is to make sure that the numerator is greater than the uh, denominator. So again, uh, this is the main objective of uh, liquefaction uh, analysis. And this is the uh, nomenclature. You can just uh, look at it uh, when you when you get the uh, notes of this uh, of this uh, lecture. Uh, in in liquefaction analysis, uh, wh wh what we did was again the Gupan uh, is still our uh, our study area. Uh, we we looked at uh, 10, uh, 10 boreholes, and uh, out of the ten boreholes, we clustered uh, these boreholes. Uh, these boreholes are scattered throughout the flat undeveloped areas of the Gupan city. So these boreholes are no longer within the central business district, but outside of the area. This is a flat, uh, flat uh, development. And you can see here that, uh, of course, we just tried to cluster the 10 boreholes. So here we clustered uh, four boreholes, boreholes one, two, five, and nine. 
they look uh, similar to each other. So this is a summary of the results from the ground level to a depth of about eight meters, loose to medium dense, uh, poorly graded sand, silty sand, and values range from uh, seven to uh, 29. And of course, uh, beyond eight meters, we have a denser soil. So again here, uh, just by looking at it, of course, we can back it up with uh, theoretical calculations. The upper layer is uh, susceptible to uh, liquefaction. The lower, the lower layer is not. And uh, also, we had also the other uh, three boreholes, three, six, seven, uh, and eight. Uh, there's a firm layer uh, at the top, uh, two meters, uh, highly plastic, uh, highly plastic silt, highly plastic clay. Uh, and below that, uh, of course, is, uh, is again, uh, liquefiable uh, ground and uh, 10 meters, it's very dense and stable soil. Take note, uh, research has shown that if you have a non-liquefiable layer on top, it also adds as uh, support for your light, uh, for your light uh, structures. Boral 4, uh, basically uh, the same. Uh, stiff clay layer, one to two meters, uh, one to three meters on top, then a liquefiable layer, and then we have the dense uh, stable layer, borehole 10, uh, very uh, similar to the others, only that we observe a one meter uh, stiff, uh, highly plastic clay on top, uh, and then below that is the liquefiable uh, soil. And this is a summary of all of the boreholes that I have uh, shown. Uh, out of the 10 boreholes, uh, by, by the formulas that uh, we have used, uh, it's practically, each, uh, practically all of the boreholes have an issue with regards to liquefaction. Bore, borehole 1, 0 to 5 meters. Borehole 2, 0 to 5. Uh, borehole 3, 2 to 5.7. So if, 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 imagine if, if you are doing a horizontal development or a subdivision development, you, you drill uh, 10 boreholes in your, uh, in your uh, area. And then you, you, you look at this and uh, if you look at this, then uh, in case of an earthquake, it's easy to see that uh, your area would liquefy. So what, what, uh, what would you do? What would you do? Of course, if it were a high rise uh, building, not much. Why? Because you can justify easily a 30 or 40 meter board pile foundation and it will all solve all your liquefaction problems but let's focus on horizontal development. That's the focus of our research. What are the options if you cannot justify the prohibitive cost of a board pile foundation for small houses, small warehouses, small manufacturing plants? You, you don't want a very expensive foundation for that. So what are our options? This also is of course the output of uh, Liquify uh, Pro it's a commercial software, which you can easily uh, use. You just have to input the magnitude of the earthquake, the acceleration and the red zone here uh, indicates that, you know, from zero to about four meters, you, you, you have a big liquefaction problem. So that, that prompts the uh, geotechnical engineer to find ways on how to solve this liquefaction problem. How do you mitigate uh, that, uh, that uh, problem? And one issue also is, uh, of course, lateral uh, spread. If uh, generally uh, liquefiable ground is also found near river channels. If you have a river channel, uh, slow velocity, very sharp curves, and you, you have alluvial deposits, there's a strong chance that uh, lateral spread can, uh, can, uh, can happen. And lateral spreading happens on very gentle slopes. And wh what do you mean by very gentle slopes? Slopes from one to three degrees uh, in the field have, have, are known to induce uh, lateral uh, spreading. And uh, what, can, uh, what can we do? Uh, all you have to do is uh, draw a cross section of uh, you get two or three boreholes, uh, draw a cross section. We, we picked up uh, in, in our uh, sample in there, uh, we picked up uh, borehole three and borehole uh, nine uh, in there. There's a lateral spread. Uh, there's a lateral spread uh, issue uh, in here. So from, uh, from uh, in, in this area, the orange one uh, is the one that will liquefy. And of course, uh, once the orange layer here 
liquefies, it will it won't simply settle going down. It will both settle and translate towards the river because the river has no lateral uh, confinement. So this is one thing uh, you should also look at when you're trying to assess uh, building structures on uh, liquefiable, uh, liquefiable deposits. Sand boils and uh, lateral spreads, uh, just some uh, photos. Uh, uh, here, uh, yes, uh, I think this is in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, New Zealand from Michiko uh, Kubinovsky. Uh, well, we, we went to school uh, together uh, many, years, uh, many years back. Uh, lateral uh, spread uh, during the Loma Prieta, uh, Loma Prieta uh, earthquake. So let's move on now to the final uh, section of my uh, presentation. Uh, once we, we have assessed uh, liquefiable ground, once uh, we are sure that there'll be liquefaction and we cannot, because the challenge really here is that you have liquefiable ground and you have light structures. And the challenge here is, uh, what do I do? Uh, I cannot jump into a deep foundation. I have to do something with my, with my ground. Uh, of course, it should be economically feasible and technically uh, viable. So this is just a a uh, short uh, flow chart, if you want to say it, or a sequence of uh, analysis. Of course, proper planning. You make sure that the uh, environment is taken care of, analysis and design. Uh, in the analysis and design, uh, this is the analysis now and design of the ground improvement uh, measures. But after ground improvement, a very important step that a few people forget is you want to verify if you really have improved the ground. Because some people, uh, after improving the ground, they, 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 they jump into building their structure. So there's, there has to be a verification of improvement uh, of the uh, area. And of course, our uh, quality control uh, measures uh, also. So uh, there are two types of uh, intervention when we are uh, dealing with uh, structures on uh, liquefiable ground. There's what we call the structural uh, intervention. We do something about the structure. And the other one, of course, is the geotechnical intervention. We do something uh, about the uh, ground or, or, or we can do both. And of course, uh, a rigid foundation system is, is one of the best ways. Imagine if you just have a one or two story house in your subdivision development. Uh, you have tie beams on, on both directions, that's one. And of course, uh, we have a rigid uh, floor slab tied to the columns of the of the uh, of the house, and of course it's e very easy to say this: uh, tie beams in both directions, uh, rigid floor slab. But again, if you're developing a low-cost housing project, this becomes really a, a challenge because this this also adds up to your uh, to your uh, to your cost. So again, uh, there are some economic calculations involved. Uh, it's usually the marketing department uh, that doesn't want uh, these solutions. But if you're with the engineering department, uh, by all, please uh, try to enforce these, uh, these uh, solutions. Uh, the, the, the other step is anchoring of equipment and flexible uh, connections. Uh, anchoring of equipment, it's, uh, it's very common uh, in, uh, in uh, earthquake prone countries like Japan. Uh, cabinets, TV sets, uh, tables are anchored uh, against the wall. There's a special, it's just, it's just a, a small chain in case uh, there's an earthquake, your, uh, your tables and cabinets won't, won't fall uh, on top of you. That's one. And the other one, of course, is to make sure that you have flexible connections. If you have uh, adjacent structures, your water lines, uh, drainage lines, uh, there's a flexible joint. Uh, in between them uh, to make sure that in case there's differential settlement, these flexible joints can tolerate a little bit of differential settlement and your lifeline facilities or your pipes will still be in good working uh, condition. Deep dynamic compaction is very common for uh, horizontal uh, development, but uh, of course uh, you can only do uh, this this uh, deep dynamic compaction if you don't have adjacent structures, because if you have adjacent structures, uh, you will shake the entire area and the adjacent structures will be damaged. So the, the assumption here 
is that you're in a new development, maybe a previous uh, fish pond or a reclaimed area in which you can easily do this uh, deep uh, dynamic uh, compaction. This is the process. You just have a heavy weight, uh, lift it up, uh, let it fall. Then it will uh, produce a, uh, a crater uh, like this. Then you will have a compacted area. This is uh, very good for uh, liquefiable ground, uh, very good for uh, liquefiable soil. It can easily compact uh, the sandy nature of your uh, soil. Of course, uh, this is just the uh, quick description of the process. You have a hammer weight, you drop it. And then of course, uh, it can improve uh, thicknesses uh, of up to uh, 15, uh, up to 15 uh, meters. And of course, uh, there are a few things that uh, affect uh, the effectiveness of your compaction. You have to look at the soil type, initial density, what your target density, the location of the groundwater uh, table, what's the geology of the site. And of course, you have compaction variables, drop height, uh, weight of hammer, number of drops. Uh, it's always good uh, if you're doing uh, deep dynamic compaction is to compact a pilot area, so to speak, perhaps a, a 20 meter by 20 meter pilot area. If you're trying to uh, do deep dynamic compaction in a few hectares, you can have a 20 meter by 20 meter uh, pilot area and you can check there uh, the effectiveness of your uh, compaction uh, process. Some tables uh, uh, on uh, on what uh, on the level of uh, compaction, if you have loose sand, clay sand, uh, silty sand, uh, drop of weight mass, and uh, the depth of improvement in here, you can uh, look at that uh, later. And of course, uh, it induces a crater about uh, one drop is about one to uh, one and a half uh, meters uh, deep. And of course, uh, take note: there's a very strong environmental impact vibration, noise, and lateral ground movement. So if you do deep dynamic compaction and there's an adjacent structure uh, beside, once you compact it, the adjacent structure might be damaged. So please uh, exercise this with uh, caution. You can only do this for, uh, for large open uh, areas. So here, uh, some challenges. Uh, groundwater level should be uh, lowered. Uh, confirmatory measures should be done. And of course, not recommended to mitigate a lateral uh, spreading because the, if you, you, you can you only compact vertically and of course if you compact vertically it will practically induce uh, the lateral uh, spreading of the of the uh, of the ground and of course uh, we also have our quality control uh, procedure uh, monitoring visual observations checking height and drop locations and field evaluation one to two weeks after dumping why are we stressing uh, this is a very critical uh, thing to uh, put our attention a little bit. Why are we stressing field evaluation one to two weeks after tamping? Because during tamping, uh, pore water pressures develop. Uh, you're not sure that it's purely coarse grain. There's, there can be fine grain soils below. And it takes a while for these pore water pressures to dissipate. Three days, four days, five days. So again, you should also try to test maybe a week uh, after compaction. Don't test immediately because you'll be surprised of the low values that you will be uh, getting. And of course, uh, there are, we have a lot, of, we have a menu of choices on the uh, equipment that we can use. We can use the dynamic cone, SPT, or even the static plate load tests. So always remember any ground improvement that, uh, that you do, please assess uh, the improvements uh, Please assess post improvement to know or validate whether your target capacities have been uh, have been uh, achieved or have been uh, attained. Mass mixing uh, it's a simple uh, process. Also, all you need is an excavator and the uh, attachment uh, on top. Uh, you you uh, well there are two methods here uh, either a wet uh, wet mixing or dry mixing. When you say wet mixing. It's really a dry binder that you mix. When you say dry mixing, you add water and it's a slurry uh, that you, uh, that you uh, mix, uh, usually done with a mixing drum. It's less expensive than the deep mixing, very effective for depths of uh, less than uh, five meters. Uh, why are we focusing uh, a lot on five meters? Because uh, that's where the stresses are 
if you're just building a one or two story uh, house in your subdivision development. Two methods, uh, the wet uh, and dry. And of course, uh, the, the, the wet method uh, is more technically and financially uh, challenging. Again, uh, the same uh, QC, uh, total amount of uh, binder uh, delivered, uh, mixing time, uh, and it's also operator dependent, and you have the usual post-improvement uh, measures or post-improvement uh, tests that you can, uh, that you can do. Uh, the last method, uh, which I'll discuss, is compaction, uh, compaction uh, grouting. We, uh, of course, uh, you, you inject a uh, cement uh, mix uh, into the, uh, into the uh, soil. It, uh, well, it can, all, it, it can be before uh, the structure. It can also be after you build the, uh, the structure. Low slump, uh, very stiff mortar mix. Uh, it, it can be high pressure to displace and compact soils, about 1,000 PSI of uh, pressure. Very effective for coarse grain soils, and again, uh, you can treat uh, as thick as uh, 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 you can treat soil as thick as uh, as five uh, meters. Uh, improved soils can be very stiff, and the grout column may act as a vertical uh, reinforcement. So, shallow foundations, of course, you have a process here for both uh, shallow foundations and mat uh, foundations. And of course, uh, you we have to uh, follow. Uh, the usual uh, QC and uh, post uh, improvement uh, tests to uh, to make sure that uh, our uh, our target capacities or target post improvement capacities are uh, met. So now to my uh, conclusion, we studied that the Dagupan City susceptible to liquefaction has a history of lateral spreading. So if you have any development in this uh, similar area. Uh, therefore, uh, take note, you have to assess if it's liquefiable. And here we have uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, options. Of course, in the subdivision, there are big structures, uh, clubhouses that are large, perhaps do a size-specific uh, geotechnical assessment. On highly liquefiable ground, uh, shallow foundations may only be used if ground improvement techniques are, are followed because uh, once it liquefies, you will have uh, you will have uh, problems, and of course uh, the minimum that you should do is of course uh, to have a rigid foundation uh, system. It's uh, the uh, structural uh, intervention uh, that you can do. Uh, just use tie beams and make sure your slabs are uh, are uh, integrated to your to your columns. But again, as I said, uh, you it's it's really. A, it's not a technical challenge. All you have to do is do it. It, it usually becomes a uh, financial challenge, especially on the uh, on the low cost uh, housing uh, market. And of course, quality control and post uh, assessment uh, checking should be done uh, in order to confirm the uh, post improvement properties of the uh, ground. So this is the end of my talk. Again, I would like to thank uh, PIC for uh, for inviting me. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them uh, during the open session. If your questions won't be answered, please send me an email. Uh, I'll do my best to, to answer your questions. So thank you and uh, good afternoon. Okay, thank you very much, Alexi Sige. So before we take a break, because there will be a break to do product presentations, we'll go first through the questions and answers. So uh, there have been some questions that have already been answered, and I'll just summarize what they are. One question um, was if there are standardized tests in the Philippines, and just to reiterate uh, Alan's answer, he says that for, uh, in the Philippines, we use ASTM and AASH to uh, standard, so we don't have our own, but our uh, most of the testing protocols, even for most materials, are either ASTM, uh, ASHTO, uh, and I'm not really sure, but there may be also British standards that may be applicable here. But the ones that we are more familiar with, given the fact that we are American-oriented, are ASTM and uh, ASHTO. Now, what I'd like as a follow-up question to this is that I, I think that what is unique about uh, Alan's test is that I'm not too sure if the current ASTM and 
uh, ashto standards involve uh, soils which are saturated. So I'd like to ask si Alan to answer that question because I think his test uh, involves uh, soils that are saturated, whereas current uh, standards do not. That's right. Thank you, Doc, for highlighting that. In fact, when I was presenting this to uh, the panel and one of the panel members is Dr. Bergado himself, who is a renowned uh, geosynthetics expert. So when he saw the pull-out test that I made, so as far as he is concerned, he told me that this equipment that I did for a submerged uh, testing for a pull-out test is as far as he knows, it's the first time, it's the first uh, kind of pull-out test. And I was even surprised that there is uh, no submerged capabilities of uh, pull-out equipment that I know of. And one of the uh, pull-out test equipment I knew is from Asian Institute of Technology and also University of Manitoba from Dr. Marolo Alfaro. And then when I consulted them, uh, they told me also that there is, as far as ASTM is concerned, there is no submerged uh, capability of all the uh, pull-out machine that they did. So I was honored to say that this is really the first equipment that we did a submerged pull-out testing of geogrid soil interaction. Okay. And then uh, the, there was a question on what are the limits of MSE walls. So uh, I think Alan's answer was it really depends on the overburden load as well as the bearing capacity of the foundation. Obviously, if the foundation cannot, cannot withstand the weight of the wall together with the surcharge, you will have a deep seated failure. So that's basically it. But uh, I would imagine what are the normal, maybe a, a, a follow up to this, a corollary would. What are the normal heights of MSE or what's normally the highest height of MSE walls that you have seen applications that you're aware of? Okay, so in the Philippines, when, when we did a lot of uh, just inspection all over the records, some records, so usually the MSEs are placed on bridge approaches and most likely for bridge approaches, the opening under uh, bridges are within six meters or thereabouts. Therefore, the MSE walls uh, extended to the top of the uh, road slab will be about seven meters high. So more or less it's like that. And this is usually carried out for uh, normal soils without any ground improvements. So without... to do some ground improvements and so the bridge approach has to be piled so that we will be able to transfer some of the loads from the surface of the existing ground to a deeper portion. So the MSE wall, the 185 and 215 meter length of MSE wall is now seated on a pile in order to reach that uh, 14 meter high uh, okay. MSE wall. Okay, now I will ask uh, Mark Morales, based on his experience, what are some of the heights of MSE walls that you have uh, worked on, or what is the maximum height that you're aware of that uh, you can have a geogrid? I think uh, what we're thinking about here is where you have a, a polymer geogrid type of reinforcement. What's normally the average height of the uh, walls? Yeah. Um, similar to what Dr. Botuyan just mentioned, the typical range of application that we're seeing now, especially for bridge approaches, yeah, it's in the six to eight meter range. But the tallest, like uh, me personally, that we've worked on is um, it's a two tiered MSE along the slope of Ayala. I think um, Eric Santos might be presenting this later. Um, it's around 23, 23.5 meters. And then we also did one on reclaimed ground that was Siguro around 19, 19.5 meters. But that was on, you know, on, on on improved ground. Actually, both of those structures are on improved ground because the, 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 um, the loads are relatively high. So we had to do some you know, um, improvement of the foundation. So 
Um, yeah, so the max we've done so far is 23 plus. But I think in other countries, um, in India and in China, they're going really, really big there, like 50 meters, 60 meters. Yeah, I think the main constraint there is uh, it becomes like the embedment length because, you know, you have to have a certain length, like 80% of the height for the length of the geo grid. So the, the, the space becomes the, the prohibited, prohibiting factor. Eh? But yeah, in other countries, they've gone as high as 40, 50, 60 meters. Okay. So uh, I think this is just a clarification question. Uh, there was a question asking, uh, aside from the seats of I, obviously you have factors of safety there. It's not yeah. nice to just have a factor of safety one. You also have some factors of safety uh, in the design for uh, the rupture and the pull out. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Uh -uh. So, okay. And uh, uh, there was a question Does MSEG grid? Uh, is it only constructed in a vertical position? I, what, what I think what he means over here is that when you lay out the geo grid, it's in a horizontal position as you build the uh, backfill or the, uh, the reinforced backfill in layers. You normally lay the geo grid horizontally. Are you aware of any case where it's inclined? Like, I guess he's thinking if you can have ground apples that are inclined downwards, can they have been killed uh, inclined downwards? Or uh, yeah. are you unaware of that? Yeah, basically the, the purpose of a geogrid is really to take advantage of the overburden pressure. So if the overburden pressure is not uniform from end to end, then basically, uh, it's not going to be a uniform distribution of uh, pressure. And the problem there is there is going to be a incline or a horizontal component of the load that is added to the pull out. So it's not going to be very efficient. So it is very important that the laying of the geo grid should be flat, straight, and tight. Okay. So uh, I'll go to Alexis. Uh, there was a question regarding uh, here, there was a question regarding sinkholes and liquefaction. Now, maybe uh, what we need to clarify, or I'll ask Alexis to clarify the difference between a sinkhole and a sand boil. So maybe uh, I can ask Alexis to talk about that because uh, then uh, I think the question is, uh, is a sinkhole a result of liquefaction? Uh, well, uh, uh, first a sand boil. If if uh, if pore water pressure develops, the the sand with the pore water uh, tries to escape, and it, it can only escape upward because of the lateral uh, confinement. So uh, when it goes out the ground, it will form a small uh, volcano-like structure. So that is your sand boil. But after a while, if the pressure is so high, you you'll have a hole. And some people call that a, uh, a uh, sinkhole. So a sinkhole is is after the sand boil. Uh, if the pressure is so high, you have a big hole. So people call that a uh, a, uh, a sinkhole. So it, it, but, it, it's uh, installation. Uh, so the, I guess what uh, we're trying to say is that we need to distinguish between sand boils that then manifest themselves as sinkholes. Sinkhole. Sinkholes. Because... I uh, recall the experience in the 2013, October 2013, whole earthquake. There were, uh, there were significant sinkholes there, but due to the karstic nature of, uh, this was in Tagbilaran, so yeah, due to the karstic nature, this is where you have um, limestone formations in which you have silicon cavities. So very often when you have an earthquake, the ceiling of this cavity caves in, and that is a sinkhole. So that's normally what the geologist would refer to a sinkhole, whereas the the depressions that fall during a uh, during a uh, liquefaction episode might really be first the sand boil leading to a uh, sinkhole. A, uh, what you call that? To a uh, sinkhole. <laughs> yeah, sinkhole. Uh, I am trying to look here at some other questions. 
Oh, okay. It says here, with regards to the compaction grouting method to mitigate uh, liquefaction, is there any standard drought that should be used for this method? By the way, I'll also ask Alan to answer this because I know Alan is also is one of the uh, uh, earliest experts in compaction grouting. <laughs> Okay, so I'll first ask uh, Alexis. Uh, well, uh, I'm not an expert in compaction grouting, so maybe Alan can uh, can answer that. Well, one input about compaction grouting, uh, the, uh, the the target bearing capacity is one, but the, the, the usual problem really is the spacing. Because uh, sometimes if, if you grout, of course in the textbook, the compaction grout is perfectly okay, but in reality, once you excavate, uh, the, the, the diameter really, uh, really, really changes, and it's in these gaps in which you have uh, you have uh, problems. So my recommendation when, when you're doing compaction grouting is always again have a pilot uh, area, because uh, a lot of factors in here, even the age of the pump, uh, has a lot of factor because uh, a brand new pump can can put in a lot of uh, pressure, uh, an old pump cannot. So. Again, uh, it's it's always best to uh, to excavate because some people they just look at the number of bugs and the volume, etc., and so on. But once you excavate, uh, it goes in all uh, in all directions. So perhaps uh, Dr. Alan can can help me complete the answer. <laughs> oh, the reason why I'm referring to Dr. Alan is that I know many of the applications that you have had have been in fine grain soils to address the consolidation settlement. Or when there has been subsidence due to consolidation settlement, then you have used this to underpin. So I guess the question here is, can this be used as a prophylactic or a preemptive way of mitigating the Okay. So may I answer, Doc? Thank you, yeah. Doc Alexis. Yeah. So when when we did some uh, grouting procedure in one of the buildings, a five-story building in Divisoria, beside a 33-story building there, the building subsided by about 12 inches on one side, and the middle is about 8 inches. And then there's a differential settlement towards the 33-story building. So the question now is, how do we arrest first? So imagine a five-story building and a 33-story building that's ongoing in construction. So definitely during the excavation and the watering on the 33-story building, uh, there is going to be some sinking in the five-story building. So you imagine the conference room on any of the floors of this four building, one of the chairs to the on one of the sides of the table will go and slide on the other side because of the slope. So that's not the problem. And I think uh, Dr. Mark was also part of this uh, work that we have that time. So when we did a grouting, first of all, we have to determine the pre-grouting condition of the building. So we have to do some SPT, do some testing of the materials, and then do some dynamic, uh, do some consolidation and settlement analysis just to predict these values. And then later on, when we... Uh, design the grouting uh, procedure, the starting point is always to grout the perimeter of every footing such that when the corners of the shallow footing will be grouted, so we will now grout what is in the middle of the footing. So if the spacing of the footing is like, for example, five meters, five meters, so at every footing, there is always a grouting point. Then from between these five meters, basically the footing size is about two to three meters. There is a space in between those footings. So we work around these things. After we did the uh, grouting, we now conduct an SPT. So we will now know if there is a, an increase of the N values before or after the grouting is done, before we fully execute everything. And when we were now doing the grouting procedure, we don't need a high strength concrete because basically the consolidation is to push laterally the soil on the sides. And when it increases the lateral values or the lateral coefficient of this, then basically 
the uh, consequential effect is you increase the bearing capacity. And we were even surprised that we were not only able to arrest the settlement, but we were able to lift, believe me, we were able to lift the structure. Uh, that structure has a swimming pool on the ground, and then we were able to lift the swimming pool back to its original position by grouting. Yet at the same time, we also did a, uh, what you call that, the pore pressure measurement when we are grouting, because the tendency is if you grout it so fast, the tendency is you increase the pore pressure. So you will be misled that you are lifting the structure where in fact it's it's really the, the water pore pressure is lifting the structure and then when the grout has terminated, it will go back again. So it really has to be very, very slow with a, a soft concrete. So basically the strength of the concrete that was pumped is only about 1,000 to 1,500 PSI because you really don't need that much strength of the concrete. All you need to do is you consolidate the soil surrounding uh, the, the area. That's okay. all, Doc Martin. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, one, uh, one last question. We'll try to accommodate the other questions by answering to them live, but then this is a question for Alexis. If the water table is high and the overburdened soil is clay, uh, let's say there's a mountain of three to five, and the underlying soil is, uh, I would say this is, uh, they said sand or silk, slash, I'll add to, I'll modify, it's loose sand or silk. Is it susceptible to liquefaction? So maybe Alexis, the question here is, is the presence of the mantle on top uh, going to uh, mitigate the, the liquefaction? Because I know you've done a lot of research, particularly yes. in the Bupan regarding Yes, uh, uh, the the uh, non liquefiable layer. So tell them about that. Yes, uh, I, I work on a uh, an, uh, exactly the same model. Uh, we did some shaking table tests in, in the University of Tokyo, in which we had an unliquefied layer and a liquefied layer below. And yes, it will add to the stiffness of the upper layer, and it can support low structures, one, two, three stories. It will really help. If you have if you have an unliquefied layer on top, in fact, in in uh, Japan uh, right now, that's what they're doing for existing houses, in which they they discovered that directly underneath the house it is liquefiable. So what they do what do they do? They just lower the water table. If you lower the water table, it becomes dry. So technically, it becomes unliquefied. So there's this. Uh, there's this area there, which uh, Professor Tohata shared with us when he came here. Uh, it's a small subdivision. They found out it's liquefiable. So they have a continuous pump that lowers the water table so that they have a layer of non-liquefiable uh, deposit. And I remember the figure. I think the payment per household for the maintenance of the pump was only $50 per year. So a household had had to contribute $50, 50 US dollars per year for the maintenance of the pump. So to answer your question uh, uh, briefly, yes, uh, it's very helpful that you have an unliquefiable layer. So it can be a dry layer or it can be a clay layer. So uh, both ways. Okay, so we will pause there. I know you have other questions. We'll answer those questions, but now I'll ask uh, Eric to, uh, to proceed with the break. So take it uh -huh. away, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Doc. Okay. Doc Mark. And again, thank you to our speakers, uh, Sir Alexis and Sir Alan. Thank you very much. Ano, and daming, and daming questions dun sa mga topics nyo. So nanganganak, sir, yung questions. Eh. So I hope you can still stay and answer the questions in the chat box. Ano. Uh, so, but before I proceed with the next part, which is actually the awarding of the certificates and some product presentation, I'd like to remind the participants that the link for the Q question, question yung quiz natin kumbaga, will be posted now for the two topics kanina. It will be posted now on the chat box. So please answer those questions. Kasi may, may time limit lang din yung pag-answer noon. So if you don't answer it, if you're not able to be sub if you're not able to submit it, you're considered na wala kayo dun sa 
sessions na yun ano. So just try to answer it. Wala namang ano diyan. Wala namang wala namang ano yan. Wala namang points except for the attendance. Ha? So make sure you answer those uh two questions on both topics. And then okay, so uh it's now posted on the chat box so answer it now but for the meantime uh TICE would like to show our gratitude to our two speakers for the first part of the seminar so i would like to give this certificate of appreciation so i'd like to call um Dr. Alan E. Butuyan uh, i'd like to give this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Alan E. Butuyan uh, in grateful appreciation of his participation as speaker on the topic, the laboratory pullout test of geogrid reinforcement and for his invaluable contribution to the success of the webinar on geotechnical engineering held on May 21, 2020 through the Zoom meeting and experto uh, platform signed uh, engineer Frederick Season, national treasurer, chair of the interspecialty group committee. Signed, Dr. Erdson René Suero, the national president, and attested by engineer Peter Paul D., our national treasurer. So thank you, sir. Alan, Butoyan. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I would also like to, um, to set this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Alexis P. Acasio. Uh, in grateful appreciation for his participation as speaker on the topic mitigating liquefaction hazard in residential subdivisions and for his invaluable contribution to the success of the webinar on geotechnical engineering held May 21, 2020 through the Zoom and Experto platform. Given the 21st day uh, in Quezon City, signed again by first truly engineer Frederick Ciso, national treasurer and chairman of the ISG committee. Dr. Erdson René Suero, National President, and attested by Engineer Peter Poldi, our National Secretary. So thank you, Sir Alexis. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much. Thank you, PIC. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right. So let's move on. Uh, first break lang po tayo. Uh, so yung mga mag-CR, mag-bathroom break, mag-coffee break, uh, now the time. While we present our... Sponsors, again, we have our sponsors today, uh, PGA Tech Group of Companies, Peter Ground Improvement, PGA Earth Structure Solutions, PGA GeoPair Philippines, uh, Philippine Geo Analytics, AMH Philippines, Quali Test Solutions and Technologies, and Experto, uh, our partner now for this webinar, the platform. I am experto. Yun, experto. <laughs> so uh, uh, we'll take a short break. We'll have we have some product presentations for you while you have your break. So right after the product presentations, we'll continue again with our um, webinar. So again, break muna. Thank you. in civil engineering, majoring in geotechnical engineering, the title of this lecture will be Design Considerations for High Reinforced Soil Structures in a Mountainous and Seismically Active Region in Luzon, Philippines. So I'd like to give the floor to Eric Santos. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zarco, for your kind introduction uh, to the officers and directors of PICE as well as uh, the other participants and uh, guests. Uh, pleasant after to everyone. Um, I actually prepared a video record, uh, record of uh, my presentation. So I believe the technical team will be presenting this. So 
before we start, I'd just like to thank everyone for this, uh, or for PIC rather, for this uh, opportunity to contribute to this webinar. So yeah, I think we can now play the, uh, the we can now play the uh, recorded presentation. Good afternoon, fellow engineers, industry practitioners. Today, we're going to talk about slope stability and slope protection measures in general. And then more specifically, we're going to touch on using reinforced structures as a way to stabilize slopes. But let me begin. The presentation today will basically contain these topics. We're going to talk about slope failure, we're going to define what slope stability is. And then we're going to show you general stabilization methods. And then we're going to use a particular application that we've done uh, under Philippine setting. And we're going to talk about the approach that we used and so far how the structure has performed. And then lastly, we're going to talk about some key learnings or key takeaways. And hopefully you'll be able to find these helpful. Let me define first what slope failure is. Slope failure, also referred to as mass wasting, is basically the downward movement of rock debris and soil in response to gravitational stresses. Basically, because of gravity, anything that is at a higher elevation ultimately will go down. We also know from experience that the rate of movement as well as their manner of movement could vary greatly for these different slope failure mechanisms. And depending on the rate of movement, that will also be influential in whether a particular slope movement is catastrophic or not. Let me show you some common slope failure mechanisms. Starting from the upper left, corner, you have their flow. And uh, in that particular illustration, you see, for example, residual soil overlying bedrock. What happens here is that these residual soil will become unconsolidated and they will move down. But their movement will be similar to that of viscous flow unconsolidated material flowing down because of the slope angle. And then moving to the right, we have toppling or toppling failure. Essentially here, you have rock because of the discontinuities and the uh, breaks in between the rock uh, blocks. Eventually, those on the outer portion of the slope will topple over and go to a lower elevation. Then what we have here, another one is what you call a slump. Here, as shown by the white arrow, is like a rotational failure. Basically, the soil material rotates and slides down. The upper portion of that um, mass will show will be tension grass and I will show photos of that later on. Then the bottom portion near the toe there will be slumping of material. Then moving down to the lower left illustration you have sliding. Essentially you have a block of either soil or rock that we just slide down along a particular failure plane as one um, discrete object. The next is creep. Creep actually is like a form of flow failure as well, except that unlike the first example that I showed, creep basically uh, moves so slowly. It's not instantaneous or abrupt. That's why the manifestations are shown in that illustration are tilted poles and uh, misaligned tensions. And the next would be fall. Okay? In this type of failure, usually there's an undercutting 
of the lower deposits. In this case, um, because of wave action, the bottom portion of the cliff has been undercut and a block of rock is left overhanging. Then eventually, because of its weight, it's gonna fall down. Now we're trying to separate here the different failure mechanisms. But in real life, there are actually slope failures that are pretty complex and involve a combination of any of these six. Now, what are the causes of slope failures? Of course, here in the Philippines, number one is rainfall. Basically, we know from our soil mechanics that increasing the pore pressure um, also really weakens the soil in our slopes. And that causes slope failures. Second, of course, is earthquakes. When there's a uh, sufficient ground shaking, there's an acceleration of the soil mass that can also cause slope failures. Geological features, sometimes because of the geology or type of material, these will also tend for slopes to fail. Then we have erosion, uh, primarily, let's say due to water, or in certain cases, because of uh, water flowing over the slope, destabilizing the entire slope. And then lastly, and perhaps more common, will be what we call anthropogenic activities. Essentially, these are activities that are due to man. So this may include external loading, like if you have a slope, then you put a load on top, like a building or any structure, that's gonna increase the load on the slope. Second will be excavated slopes. Whenever we put up high-rise buildings in a highly urbanized area, we would excavate because you want to install several basements and the foundation as well of the building. Or you can have backfilling of slopes when you're building roads, for example. And that creates uh, slopes on the edges of the embankment. Or for uh, mine sites, when you build a waste dump, you also backfill to store the waste material. And that creates also slopes on the edges of the waste dump. Then we have here another example, rapid drawdown. This will be for um, our embankment dams containing, for example, water acting as a reservoir. When the water level in the upstream portion is abruptly lowered, that causes also slope failures. Now, what are common indicators of slope stability? In this photo, I'm showing here, for example, how tension cracks would look like. The, one, the photo on the right um, is actually from a mine site. The slope there is on the left. Um, adjacent to the vehicles. And then the tension crack is basically appearing on the edge of the road. But the slope on the left side, adjacent to the vehicles, is the one that is uh, showing slope instability. For the photo on the left, you have a road, a paved road, and you can see also the tension cracks because of the slope on the left. These are basically manifestations of slope instability tension cracks. Another indicator will be what you call a hummocky toe. And this usually happens at the slope or at the toe of the slope. Uh, the one on top is what you call a scarp. And then there can be rotations of the soil mass as it um, moves down slope. Another manifestation of slope instability is what you call power lines or tilted poles that are broken. Um, for this particular case, um, you ha basically have soil material that is creeping and through time it has uh, misaligned or tilted the poles and has broken power lines. If you notice, the gradient of the slope is not that steep, it's relatively mild, yet there is um, ground movement. Another indication will be misaligned or broken fences. 
because generally these uh, secondary structures follow a certain alignment. If the ground underneath would move, like in this case, there's a slope to the right, it would affect the alignment of this fence. And from there, you can already see that there's some slope instability further down slope. Another one would be a dip in the guardrail or broken drainage lines, whether those may be canals running parallel to the road or to the embankment. In this particular case, the wing wall um, of the cross pipe has been damaged already and eroded and that has been washed away already. And what's left here in the photo is basically the guardrail that have settled because of the loss of material supporting it. You can see there the RCPC or the reinforced concrete pipe culvert with the water flowing out going to the right. Another common indicator will be what you would call seepages on the slope. The photo on the left, um, just so that you'd be able to understand how the photo was taken, it is upslope looking downslope. And the one that's being pointed there are seepages near the toe of the slope. The one on the right is basically also seepages near the upper part of the slope. If these seepages are not addressed, they will increase the pore pressure of the slope, which will eventually contribute to slope instability. Now, slope stability is the potential or likelihood of a slope to fail due to a specific mechanism. It involves the interplay between two types of forces. What are those? The one that causes the slope to fail it's basically what we call driving forces. They can be overturning, they can be sliding, etc. And they promote the downward movement of materials due to gravitational uh, forces. Now, resisting forces, these are the stabilizing forces which prevent or deter the downward movement of materials. For most slopes, this would mean the shear strength of the slope which would try to resist the movement of the soil mass for that particular slope. Now for us engineers, the process of determining how much stress a particular slope can manage before failing, meaning before it flows down or goes down, is called stability analysis. Currently, our analysis, there are many ways that we can follow. We can use stability charts. These are very simple charts that, can e that are easy to follow. And we can use this for very quick and dirty computations just for us to have some assessment. If you have more data from your soil investigation program, there are already a lot available in the industry, um, computer programs based on limit equilibrium methods. Or if you need to determine, aside from the forces within the soil mass, but also the deformations, you can use finite element or boundary element methods. Just a note on rock slopes, they behave a bit differently from soil slopes. And generally, rock slopes are dependent on, number one, the compressive strength of rock fractures. Sorry, the compressive strength of rock. And then you also have to take into account fractures or beddings and discontinuities. Thirdly, you need to look into groundwater flow and seepages. All of these influence the stability of rock slopes. It would be good if in your team, aside from the geotechnical engineer, you also have a geologist who can provide input, input uh, for these areas. Now, slope remediation measures um, a general classification can be like this. Basically, you divide it from non-structural and structural measures. What are non-structural measures? You can look at benching and slope modification. You can look at bioengineering methods. You can look at provision of adequate surface and subsurface drainage systems. 
or if you want to address surface erosion, you can provide erosion control measures. The other side will be structural. This consists of retaining walls or reinforced soil systems, ground anchors, soil nails, or rock pole netting. Now for non-structural remediation measures, one simple way to address the instability of a slope is through benching. Essentially, the way we do this is we reconfigure the slope. If it's too steep, we try to flatten it, as shown in this particular uh, image and photo. Of course, when you reconfigure a slope, that would mean, uh, unfortunately, removing current and existing vegetation. So that would make your slope exposed also to erosion, future erosion. And when you reconfigure a slope, it's important that you provide um, a way for the water to drain out. So you need to have a drainage system to carry water and direct the flow so that they don't sporadically uh, spread out over the flow, over the slope and flow over the slope. Another way is bioengineering. Bioengineering basically uses vegetation to stabilize slopes, but usually these are effective for shallow seated failures only, not deep seated ones. In this photo that I am showing, um, as part of the uh, restoration of a mine site, trees are planted on the edge of a waste dump. But as you can see here, the slope still failed uh, because of, in this particular case, oversaturation. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, you can still see the remnants of the slopes that are that remain stable, which haven't been affected by oversaturation. And they continue to address erosion or sur uh, surface erosion due to uh, the flow of water. In this particular case, there was a a spring that migrated locations and essentially saturated the slope until it failed. So another non-structural remediation is what you call drainage improvement. By just directing the flow of water, both surface and subsurface, it can already drastically improve the stability of a slope. So it's important that a geotechnical engineer also has some knowledge in terms of how to use these um, structures or how to use drainage and improve the way a particular slope would be able to divert excess runoff. Then we have what you call sodding, or just basically putting vegetation on the soil that is stable. And by doing that, you address erosion on the surface. Available in the market also are erosion protection um, materials that can help your um, vegetation to grow relatively faster. It's an aid to ensure that the vegetation that you put on the slope would not be easily washed away when the rainy season comes. So there are many in the market, but one of, one of which is coconuts. There are also erosion mats, uh, synthetic erosion mats that are available, and you can use those to basically help your vegetation um, take root faster than usual. When the slope, the surface of the slope has been covered by vegetation, it improves its stability. Now, there are also structural uh, measures that we can adopt if you want to stabilize a slope. These are retaining walls, reinforced soil system, ground anchors, soil nails, and rock wall netting. Retaining walls, which are very common, can consist of reinforced concrete walls like the one shown here, or they can just be simple rubble masonry walls made of rock pieces. It can be made of gabions, gravity retaining walls that you just uh, pile on top of each other and 
in order to resist the lateral earth pressure behind the retaining wall. You can also have what you call reinforced soil systems. Um, the one that's shown here is already a facing, which is made of gabions. But behind that, you have soil reinforcement. In this particular case, you have uh, HDPE geogrids. Or you can have ground anchors. In this particular image, the ground anchors were installed into the ground. Uh, and this is because of an excavation for a, a uh, two or three level basement. And then in the excavation, in order to retain the verticality of the excavation, sheet piles as well as whalers were installed, connected with ground anchors. So construction was able to proceed with the foundation, the basement unhampered. You can also have what you call rock anchor stabilization. You basically connect uh, pieces of boulders or rocks and stabilize them through rock anchors. Another approach is to use soil nails uh, in this particular photo, you have a shot creek facing. The soil nails are the ones with a rectangular, with a square plate. In between them are downspouts. And then there's a steel mesh, which basically holds together the shot creek when it is sprayed on the slope surface. So this combination uh, is a, another way for uh, slopes uh, to be stabilized. Another variation in terms of the facing of the soil nail is to use soil nails, but instead of shot feet, because shot feet sometimes will not allow vegetation to, well, it will not really allow vegetation to grow on it. You can have a combination of nettings, uh, usually made of steel. And from there, depending on the detailing, you can allow vegetation to grow on these as well, to have a more natural looking slope. Then you can have rock nets and barriers. Essentially, when there's a risk of rock pieces flow, uh, falling down or flowing down slope, you can install these uh, steel nets and barriers to catch uh, these uh, pieces of rock that are falling down. Now, let me discuss with you a specific application especially for our uh, conditions here in the Philippines. We all know here that in the Philippines, we, we are well known for the numerous geohazards that we have, one of which is seismicity. Um, the Philippines is uh, situated within the uh, Circum Pacific Belt, or what they call the Ring of Fire, where 80% of the world's earthquakes occur. Shown here also are the uh, distribution of faults and trenches. And practically the Philippines has a lot of those. So except for Palawan area, uh, most of um, the rest of the country, uh, when you design structures or when you uh, do mitigating measures, you need to consider seismicity. Also in our country, um, we experience large precipitation, a huge amount of rainfall. Based on the records of uh, Pagasa, the average rainfall in the month of September from 1981 to, 1981 to 2010 ranges from 300 to 500 millimeters on most areas in the zone. We all know here uh, the setting of typhoons and floods. We, all, we even have the Habagat phenomenon in recent years. So we should, our structures, when we design them, especially for slope stabilization, should be able to address the volume of rain that our mitigating measures are subjected to. On the average, 20 tropical cyclones pass through the Philippines, five of which can be classified as destructive. 
Moreover, the country often experiences heavy rainfall during Habagat, or what you call the Southwest Monsoon, uh, which falls from months of June to October. This is, I mean, these are just photos showing how rainfall really affects the stability of slopes. These are photos taken during Typhoon Mangkut, and uh, this is in 2018. And as you can see, a lot of mountainside slopes um, failed, affecting critical road infrastructure and damaging as well um, dwellings that are along the path of the slope failure. Now, for this particular example that uh, we are showing, the application of a slope stability. The area is generally underlain by volcanic deposits, relatively young, quaternary only, and they are chiefly pyroclastics coming from volcanic debris from uh, a nearby volcano. Now, these pyroclastics generally consist of interbedded shale and sandstone, and then sometimes thin layers of tuff and uh, rework sandy tuffs and partly topacious shale. Now, based on the results of the geotechnical investigation, the recovered soil samples are generally classified as silty sand with medium dense to very dense relative condition. Now, this particular site, uh, the development calls for the construction of an access road. Because it's uh, in a mountainous area, there's a hairpin configuration. Obviously, when you alter the existing topography, it is necessary to construct a road network system to be able to access the development. Now, considering the proposed road grading, slope stabilization and protection measures were deemed necessary for the construction of the road. The investment on the pavement and the utilities will be put to waste if the slopes fail. Now, for this particular case, we considered a reinforced rail structure as a slope stabilization and protection measure. Later on, I'll show you the configuration, the hairpin, as well as the slope sections, for us to be able to appreciate more uh, this particular application. We know that reinforced rail structures are good alternatives when working with high fills, where ground settlement and drainage are concerned. The reason for the high fills is that since a road has to be constructed, we need to follow the um, vertical um, alignment because there are limits to the gradient that the roads can accommodate. And because of that, backfilling of side slopes need to be done. Now, what is a reinforced soil structure? Essentially, um, it is soil that is reinforced by another material. It can be made of steel, it can be made of a geotextile, it can be made of um, HDP material, so many kinds. But essentially what it does is it reinforces the soil and allows it to perform better compared to just ordinary backfill without reinforcement. In this particular illustration, we used uh, gabions as the facing, but these gabions are tied together, so they're not acting separately. We also um, use this particular um, system because it's flexible and it can, I mean, it can take in or tolerate some deformation compared to, for example, rigid concrete retaining structures. Now, considering the topography of the site, we also, we also anticipate surface and subsurface flow to be present, especially after heavy precipitation. And the gabion facing would provide good drainage characteristics. It will also be able to support uh, vegetation. So eventually, uh, when vegetation uh, overruns the surface of the gabions, it's gonna look natural compared to, for example, a concrete um, wall. Now, what are the design considerations that we uh, used or took into account? Shown here, for example, on the left is the hairpin configuration of the road, which is typical for mountainous areas. 
If the slope is steep, the only way for your road to go down is to do or to follow is to follow a hairpin configuration. Now there are two sections shown here, section A and section B, and these are the sections. So basically, there are for this particular slope there are two roadways that need to be supported, and all these roadways are on fill. We couldn't do cut. Um, we couldn't cut any more into the slope because the gradients of the roads will be affected. It's going to become too steep for vehicles to use. An important design consideration is what, as I mentioned before, precipitation. Because we don't want um, uh, the strength of our, the stability of our, our slope basically is influenced by the saturation of the soil in the slope. So when we did the analysis, this was taken into account. In this particular case, we use the pore pressure, uh, pore water pressure ratio, the RU, to, to take into account the presence of water in the slope model. Another very important consideration is seismicity. The site is the, obviously in the Philippines, that's why it's in a seismically active region. And there were two identified major fault lines that were near the site. Basically the West Valley Fault System and then the Lubang Fault. We took into account the seismicity of the area by using the Fukushima and Tanaka attenuation model. And PGA values of 0.3 and 0.28 were computed for West Valley Fault and the Lubang Fault respectively. We then cross-checked this with the PGA values also verified from uh, the PGA acceleration map of the Philippines published by PVOX. So for this particular project site, we anticipate that the PGA will be between 0.3 and 0.4 G. Now, slope stability analysis. Let me share with you the approach that we did. So we built a slope model using uh, geotechnical software and from there, we model the configuration of the road as well as the hairpin. And then at certain sections, we would analyze and see if they are um, safe and stable. So we as shown here, we, sh we put there the parameters for the soil as well as the configuration of the road. Let me explain later why we need to put ground improvement, but uh, offhand, because the presence of um, then silty sand is a bit deep, we have to introduce ground improvement so that the weight of the fill will be carried and distributed and transferred down to the uh, competent dense silty sand layer. Now for slope stability analysis, for global stability, we consider these, these six cases and written here are the different parameters for the pore water pressure as well as the earthquake acceleration values. Um, shown here also are the minimum factors of safety. For slope stability analysis, it's really an iterative process. And you do this for specific segments of your slope. And then these are just the results. So as you can see, um, by altering the configuration of the reinforce all structures and by altering the ground improvement uh, levels as well as the spacing. Ultimately, after doing several iterations, we were able to reach a configuration which basically produces the needed safe factors of safety or factors of safety that meet our requirements. Now we also check local stability of the reinforced all structures. And we did this for every 10 meters because as the road goes down, the cross section of the reinforced cell structures vary as well. So they change. So we check the factors against sliding, against overturning, against bearing capacity, and then against settlement, as well as pull out, which are important uh, items that need to be checked when you use reinforced cell structures. These are results of uh, the stability analysis, but incorporating the ground improvement. If you look at the ground improvement measures, uh, we basically used here um, 
grounded piles or soil cement columns drilled into uh, into the soil so that it can reach the, the stable and competent soil layer, the, the dense silty sand layer. As you can see here, uh, without those ground improvement um, uh, provisions, the slope by itself, even with the use of the reinforced soil structure, will, will fail. Now, considering the heavy precipitation that the site experiences during monsoon seasons, it's important that proper drainage be detailed into the design. In this particular case, we use uh, for the facing gabions, which are highly permeable. Behind it, we put also uh, drainage blankets so that any seepage that will flow through the slope before it enters the reinforced zone, it will already be intercepted and drained out. We also introduce clay capping on the surface to minimize uh, rainfall from seeping into the reinforced soil zone. Now, based on those design considerations, we went back to the site several years later and um, we just look at the performance against rainfall. So, for example, this one, we know that the, our country basically experiences a lot of typhoons in a year. Uh, in 2016, there was this typhoon, Typhoon Lawin, and as you can see, it basically covers predominantly most of the country already. We also checked against seismic performance. Um, we looked at, uh, for, that, for a particular year in 2017, there were several earthquakes that happened uh, with magnitude 5.5, from a minimum of 5 to as high as 6.2, all near the area where the reinforced soil uh, structures were installed to stabilize the mountain slope. The locations of these um, uh, seismic, genera uh, seismic generators is within a 20 kilometer to 40 kilometer uh, distance from the project site. Fortunately, the RSS structures as well as uh, the road that were supported by the slope stabilization measure, didn't sustain any cracks or deformation. This is a photo taken in uh, 20, latter part of 2017 and 2018. And as you can see, uh, the structure is still very much intact and performing as expected. Okay, let me now uh, wind down my presentation. Let's look at uh, some key takeaways. Number one, slope instabilities can often be complex and it involves techniques outside the field of geotechnical engineering. As mentioned earlier, you have to be familiar with structural, you have to be familiar with drainage, uh, you have to be familiar with other fields, even civil works when you're doing road design. But sometimes the best solution will not come from slope protection design, perhaps by realigning the roads or just changing the gradients of the road, you can already save much from uh, the cost of providing slope protection. In other words, you can optimize uh, the, the goal to stabilize the slope by approaching it from different um, fields, no, aside from geotechnical engineering. Now, RSS structures, if they are properly designed, are deemed to be an effective and suitable component of slope stabilization measures, especially in seismically active regions. Also, proper drainage management systems, both surface and subsurface, meaning surface runoff from storms as well as uh, seepages within the soil, are key to stabilizing slopes against the impact of heavy precipitation. Ground improvement measures may be further be needed to address global instabilities. In this particular case, we have to use soil cement columns to stabilize further the underlying ground. It is also important that developments in mountainous regions, especially those involving significant earthworks, that a geotechnical engineer needs to be part of the design team early on during the design stage in order to address slope instabilities arising from site development design and activities. 
as I mentioned earlier, much of slope instabilities come from anthropogenic activities or they're, they're man-made. So it's important that early on, a geotechnical engineer is already part of the team. Then lastly, the inputs of a geologist are also vital to having a holistic understanding of a slope and its underlying stabilities, especially for rock slopes. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, okay, so we will go to our final um, speaker, who is Brian, the engineer Brian B. Tan. So Brian is currently the principal of Brian B. Tan Engineering Consulting Services, and he's also the executive vice president of Anta Construction Corporation. He has a master's in civil engineering and uh, majoring in geotechnical engineering from uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So I would like to invite uh, Brian uh, to give this lecture. Oh, sorry, I ran into a little, and I just need to reopen my Zoom. If you could give me a minute. <laughs> Okay, so while we are waiting for Brian, I think I've answered some of the questions, but uh, after uh, Brian has uh, finished his lecture, I will ask some of our resource people to, uh, to answer some of the questions also, okay? <coughs> So, uh, I'm just happy that we're able to like okay, maybe while we're waiting for Brian, there's this question what uh, are the short term and long term um, uh, analysis? I think this is for the this is for Eric. Uh, uh, what are the what are the long term and short term analysis in uh, regarding the slope stability analysis? Yes, uh, Doc Z. Um, well, for one, uh, for example, in this case, we use uh, HDP reinforcement. So we have to check against uh, creep of the material itself. Yeah. Uh -oh. and then, so we have to look into that. And then uh, um, for the slope stability, basically, we just factor in some reduction in the um, uh, soil material because through time, sometimes they continue to weather. So we just include that already in the analysis as part of the iteration. So yeah, that, that's basically... Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, but then I think there's also the addition when we talk of long and short term analysis, the fact that sometimes when you build a structure, the foundation is a fine grained material. So, hasn't yeah. yet consolidated. So, Sorry, the short term would be basically that. And then the long term is what happens uh, down the road when it's already consolidated and gained strength. So. That's the uh, that's the main thing I think I can add to it. So here we go with uh, Brian Tan's presentation. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, can you see my screen? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon. So uh, thank you for inviting me to to give a to give a uh, lecture here in, in this webinar. Um. So what initially when I was discussing with Dr. Zarko what um what topic. Uh, we were going. I was going to discuss initially. We wanted to do something related to geotechnical reports, but then we felt that you know it might be better if um, if we could uh, if we could maybe uh, do something before geotechnical reports, meaning that the part of the study that you do before a geotechnical report is done. So we discussed that we I should probably talk about soil investigation first. And then maybe in a future lecture, we could, uh, we could talk about the aspects of a geotechnical report. Okay, so, so first question uh, we have to ask is, uh, why do we need to investigate the soil in each project? Okay, so first and foremost, soil is heterogeneous. Uh, second, soil is a natural material and does not have well understood properties. 
And third, uh, soil conditions can be highly variable. So very often we're asked by the client, um, can we use the soil investigation from an adjacent site, from a nearby site? Or uh, since we already have all these maps from PBOS, can we just use that you know, for, for, to, to investigate the site? And the, the answer there is th uh, it's not advisable to use data from outside your property simply because your, your conditions can vary so much you know, from, from point to point. So there is always an advantage to doing a study, an individual study for, for each site. Okay, so the discussion outline will be, so I'll first talk about briefly about soil and rock characteristics. Then I'll talk about field sampling and then laboratory testing, in-situ testing, and then what a typical soil investigation in the Philippines would look like. Okay. So first, uh, soil characteristics. So we have to, we have to break down um, soil into the types. No? So you have a two general types of soil. You have a granular soil and a cohesive soil. Uh, what's important to understand is these two materials have different types of properties. So they would behave differently. So uh, the first type of soil is granular or what we also refer to as non-plastic. So that's generally your gravel and your sand. And it's for particles that have uh, uh, that stay above the number 200 sieve. Okay. So granular and non-plastic soils, they generally do not have interparticle forces and they have large voids. Now, one key characteristic of granular soil is that it has a high permeability. And uh, also important is the fact that the strength is derived from friction developed between the particles. And it has low to nil to low long-term compressibility. So meaning if you were to apply a load on sand, generally speaking, the amount of settlement you'll get is already what you've experienced. Now, if you compare it to the other type of soil, which is cohesive, uh, so cohesive soils, these are silts and clays. These are the particles where in majority of the particles will go below, will pass the number 200 sieve. Uh, so they are, there are uh, interparticle forces that act between the different uh, particles. And you have very small voids. And as a result of this, you have low permeability. Now the strength of cohesive soils generally is derived from interparticle cohesion. And one key characteristic of clays and silts, especially if they're soft, is they have low to high long-term compressibility. So normally we describe granular soils as being from a very loose to a very dense state, you know, depending on how on, on its condition in the ground. As opposed to in cohesive soils, you usually it usually is described as very soft, soft, medium, stiff, stiff, very stiff. Okay, so that's a clear distinction that has to be made you know, when, when describing soils. Well, of course, it's hard also. Now for soil parameters, uh, normally when you have granular soils, uh, one of the key uh, parameters is the particle grading. So you want to know how the grain size varies across, uh, across the formation. Okay. Then of course, you also need to know the strength. And again, this is usually from the friction angle between the different particles. And you also like to know the moisture density relationship. So meaning if there's this much moisture in the soil, uh, how dense can the soil be? Uh, when it comes to cohesive soils, uh, while particle grading is something we check, what's more important is the plasticity of the soil or how basically how sticky it is or its ability to absorb water. Now we also need to check the swell potential of the soil because since cohesive soils can absorb water, they have a tendency to change in volume uh, especially when transitioning from a dry to a wet state. Now we also need to check on the compressibility of the soil. No? So as I noted earlier, the, the uh, clays tend to have low, uh, long term, uh, tend to compress over the long term. Okay, now the strength, um, it's also determined, um, well, there are two types of basic strength for cohesive soils. You have an undrained and a drained shear strength. 
And then, of course, you also need to know the moisture density relationship. So, so that's for soil. Now, after soil, we also have rock. No? So again, the three types of rock formation of, uh, of rock types. So you have igneous rock, sedimentary rock, and metamorphic rock. Uh, locally, we generally have sedimentary rock. So here in the Metro Manila area, we have what we commonly refer to as, as the adobe, but it's a uh, scientific name or engineering name is the Guadalupe II formation. And then if you go further south, you also have the Taal II formation. And then once you go to, say, Cebu, some areas of Cebu, Zamboanga, you also have limestone. So now in, when it comes to rock, uh, the strength usually depends on the amount of cementation that the rock has, as well as the amount of weathering that the rock has undergone over the years. So again, the, the parameters that we need to check um, are the strength and the compressibility. So, so basically the modulus of elasticity of the rock. Okay. So that's the uh, first. So I'm going to move on to field sampling. So uh, in a soil investigation, the most important part is to be able to get a sample, right? So there are different types of sampling methods. So the first one is called disturbed soil sampling. Then you have undisturbed soil sampling. Then when you get to the rock, you do rock coring. And then you can also do test pits. So test pit, oh, I'll describe it later. So disturbed sampling, this is, um, I would say, the simplest test, uh, the simplest form of sampling that we have. So it involves the use of a thick walled sampler, also known as a more commonly referred to as a split spoon sampler. And then this is hammered into the ground in order to get a sample. And then you split the sample open in order to, to get your, oh, you, sorry, you split the sampler open to get the sample. Okay. Now the key point here is that since it's called a thick walled sampler, you can imagine that the process of driving the sampler into the ground will put the soil in a disturbed state. So in other words, you're not, um, you're not, you're destroying the fabric of the soil. So that's why it's important that uh, samples, uh, tests done on samples from a disturbed sampler are tests that are soil fabric independent. So this is what a, what a uh, split spoon sampler looks like. So you can see the, um, so you can see the, uh, here the, you see the soil sample here. So basically you split open the sampler. So the next type of sampling is called undisturbed sampling. Okay, so, uh, so the thin walled samplers, there are different types. You have the Shelby tube, which is basically just a thin, uh, a thin sampler that you push into the ground. And then there's a piston tube sampler. Uh, this is a bit more complex because there, there's a piston system that helps hold the soil in place as you extract it. And then once you get it out in the lab, you have a sample that's Generally, if it's done properly, you're able to maintain the fabric of the soil, and therefore, it's in a relatively undisturbed state. Now, since the sample is the sampler is just pushed into the ground, it can only be used for soft clays and silts. For loose sands, it's difficult because if the sand is in a loose state, when you push it into the ground and when you extract your sampler, the sand will just fall out because there's no cohesion in the sand. Okay. So uh, we do these, we do the sampler, uh, we do, well, well, the samples that we test from this, uh, no, from, the, from this sampler is for tests that require the soil fabric to be intact. Okay. So when we encounter rock, we do rotary coring. So there are three types of samplers for rotary coring. There's a single tube, the double tube, and the triple tube. Okay, so um, the single tube gives you the most disturbed type of sample for rock. So ideally, it's not something we should use because the samples that you get would have already been disturbed by a great amount. Now, a double tube sampler is when you have a sleeve inside the single tube sampler. So when you rotate the sampler, the second tube does, ideally does not rotate. So your sample is less disturbed. 
Okay, but in, in reality, it still produces a somewhat disturbed sample. So it's not ideal, but it's acceptable. Now, the third, um, the third sampler is the triple tube sampler. So this one has a sleeve inside the sleeve inside the sampler. So this would produce the least amount of disturbance and is therefore what we normally recommend. Now, for the coring bits at the end, uh, at the tip, we usually use a tungsten carbide or a diamond bit. Now, when you extract your cores, uh, the first thing that we measure is called the recovery. So the recovery gives you the total length of the recovered sample and is expressed as a percentage of the total core run. So if you have a one meter core run and you are able to get 50, uh, 500 millimeters or 0.5 meters of sample, your recovery is 50%. Now, the next uh, measure that we do is called the RQD, or the rock quality designation. So this one measures the total length of sample greater than 100 mm. And again, it's expressed as a percentage of total core run. So for example, you have your 100, let's say your one meter sample, sampler, and then you're able to extract uh, half a meter. You know? But let's say all the samples are less than 100 millimeters long, your RQD would be zero. But if let's say out of that half meter length sample, let's say half of it, let's say 25, uh, uh, 25 uh, CM is, is, has a total length of greater than, or sorry, the individual cores have a total length of more than 100 or individual lengths of more than 100 millimeters, then your RQD is 25%. Okay, so the RQD is an important indicator of how, how weathered the rock is in the ground. Now, but of course, we have to understand that this has some, um, how do I say this, operator error. Uh, there's, some, there's some technique to making sure that you're able to get a good recovery and a good RQD. So in order to get a good recovery in RQD, you need to use a good coring bit and you need to replace the core bit as necessary. No? Sometimes kasi in the field, they're, they're, they're trying not to dispose of bits that have been destroyed. So they tend to use bits that already are not very good. And of course you have to use a slower drilling speed. And ideally you should use a shorter core run because you don't want the sample to be in the sampler for a, while you're drilling. So this is a uh, this is a uh, triple tube sampler here. So you see the outer tube, inner tube, and then an inner sleeve. And this here is the coring bit. Okay. So the last uh, the last type of sampling that we typically do, no, is uh, is a test pit. So this is fairly routine. It's a two meter deep test pit usually, but you can go deeper uh, depending on your requirements. Now it gives you a large soil sample volume and it allows you to visually inspect the soil conditions. Now, now this, is, this is important because uh, very often, especially within the upper two meters, you want, to be, you want to be able to see what the soil looks like, especially if your structure is just a light structure. You want to see how well the soil looks like. You want to see if it looks like backfill. You want to see if there's some any organic soil uh, in, in, in some of the shallower layers. Okay. Okay. So that's, um, for field sampling. So once you get your, uh, your soil samples, the next thing you need to do is you go to the lab and you test it. Okay. So the first set of tests that we do are called index tests. And these are usually done on disturbed samples because the, the fabric of the soil uh, doesn't matter to the test. Okay. So these are the particle size analysis, the uh, Atterberg limits. So this is the liquid limit, plastic limit, plasticity index. Then of course the moisture content. And uh, well, there's the free swell test, and of course the specific gravity. So the second type of test that we do are the strength tests. So ideally, these are done on undisturbed samples because if you change the fabric of the soil, you know, if you 
uh, if, for example, the sample you get has been disturbed a lot, you, the strength that you'll get is very different from what's in the ground. Okay. So some of the simple, uh, well, some of the more routine strength tests that we have are the vein shear test, unconfined compression test, the direct shear test, and the triaxial shear test. Now, the third, um, the third set uh, type of test that we sometimes do is the consolidation test. And again, this is an, uh, a test that has to be done on an undisturbed sample because the fabric is very important. So for consolidation tests, you have the odometer test and the controlled rate of strain consolidation test. Now, the fourth uh, type of test that we normally do are moisture density relationships, no? moisture density tests. And these are usually done from samples from a test pit. So these are the uh, Proctor test, so standard or modified Proctor test, uh, the Harvard needing test, or the California bearing ratio. So index test. No? So I'll go through the index test first. So the goal of an index test is to have a quick and easy test that gives you an indication of basic soil properties. So these are generally inexpensive uh, and any lab can do it and you can sometimes even do it in the field if necessary. So it forms the basis of the soil classification system, the USCS. And these are what you normally get. No? So the particle size distribution, the liquid limit, plastic limit, moisture content, soil potential, and the specific gravity. So the particle size analysis, you, you use it using this equipment here. So it's a series of sieves. So you put the soil at the top, it's oven dried, then you just shake it. And, and the soil that's trapped at each, on each sieve helps you draw the, the, sieve, the grain size analysis curve. Okay. Now, if you have soils that go below uh, the number 200 sieve, you can do the hydrometer analysis to help you distinguish if the soil is a silt or a clay. Now, the next type of index test is the Atterberg limit. Atterberg limits test. So it's for cohesive soils. Um, so Atterberg limits is actually a series of three tests, no? but we normally just do two. So we usually do the liquid limit, which gives you the upper end of the plasticity range, and the plastic limit, which gives you the lower end of the plasticity range. Now, sometimes you also do the shrinkage limit, but this is not uh, very common. And one value that is always reported is the plasticity index, which is just the difference between the liquid and the plastic limit. So an another index test, the moisture content, basically you just want to know what is the moisture of the soil in the ground. Okay. Now, what's important is the sample has to be properly preserved in the field, because if not, uh, if the sample is not sealed, then by the time the sample gets to the lab, a lot of the moisture might have evaporated. Now, it may not be useful for clean sands and gravel because the, the process of extracting the soil from the ground already releases some of the moisture. So, so whenever you have the moisture content, you, for, for clean sands and gravel, you, you, you take it with a grain of salt. Now, another test we do, uh, it's a simple test. It's the free swell test. We use it to determine the swell potential of, a so of the soil. Now, this one doesn't have an ASTM standard. It's, it's just a very routine, uh, quick test. You just put in soil in a, in a test tube, and then you, you see how the soil expands uh, over time. Of the specific gravity, uh, it's used to determine the specific gravity of the soil particles, and you just use a pycnometer. It's a fairly routine test. So moving on to the more complicated tests, uh, the strength test. Um, so the goal is to provide an estimate of the soil and rock strength. You know? So as I said earlier, sampling disturbance is very important to strength tests because this, the, the process of removing the sample from the ground already changes the state of stress in the soil. So if you were to test it as is, or if it's a highly disturbed sample, you're not, rec you're not able to recreate the in-situ state of stress. Okay. So again, there, you can do the very simple test or a very complex test, no? depending on the needs of the project. Now the strength test parameters that you normally get, these are the undrained shear strength, the drain shear strength, uh, the unconfined compressive strength, and then you, need, you get the failure strain and the modulus of elasticity. 
Now, a simple strength test is called the laboratory vein shear. So this is done for soft claves. So you just insert this vein here into the sample and then you turn the vein. And then from there, you get an idea of the shear strength of the soil. Now, it's a very, very quick test. No? So the strength may not be accurate, but at least it gives you an estimate of, this, of the soil strength. Now, the next test is the unconfined, unconfined compression test. So it's usually done for clays and rock. Now for clays, one thing you have to understand is the clay is not in its in situ state you know, because you do not apply any confining pressure. So it can give you conservative or unconservative results depending on where you are in the, in the stress path. For rocks, uh, it will give you a reasonable indication of the strength. Uh, now it may, again, you, it's difficult to, especially for rocks, it's difficult to, to do to put the soil in the, the rock sample in the in situ state. So at least uh, we, we just use this, at least it gives you a good indication of, of what's down there. Now the next, uh, again, we're moving in order of complexity. So the next uh, uh, type of strength test is the direct shear test. So this is for soft to medium stiff clays. Now the strength, uh, the way this works is you shear the strength or you fail or you shear the sample, you fail it along a defined plane. No? And it's usually uh, the horizontal plane. So the strength from this test usually is on the higher side of, of, the, of the value. So you sometimes have to use uh, the results with caution. But it's a relatively in inexpensive test and it's fairly quick to do. Now a more, Oh, sorry. So this is what the direct shear test looks like. So you fail it here along this plane. Now the the most complicated uh, strength test uh, is the triaxial shear test. No, so you can do it on an undisturbed sample. You can do it on a reconstituted sample as well. Now you, there are three types of triaxial shear test. Uh, you can do the AST, uh, the unconsolidated undrained test consolidated undrained and consolidated drained, again, depending on the requirements of the project. Now, it's a computer controlled test. So uh, it, it, you, it's a, usually a pretty expensive piece of equipment. Uh, but the strength that you get here, assuming the test is done properly, uh, is, fair, is probably the most accurate that you can get. Now the sample shears along its weakest, weakest plane, and you can calculate the stress path of the, of the, of the failure of the soil. Now it's an expensive test and I think locally only a handful of laboratories are able to do this. Now it can take a long time to do this. So some clients, of course, they always balk at the fact that a consolidated drain test, depending on the clay that you're testing can take up to two weeks just for one test. So this is what a triaxial test looks like. Um, it's not that, uh, well, it's kind of complicated. You can buy a, a, a commercial setup like this one. Uh, this is the one I used during my master's, uh, during my master's thesis. So it's a homegrown machine, so, but it works. So as you can see here, this is a, an example of a failed triaxial test or uh, the failed, the, failed sample. So you see here the failure plane is a classic uh, X, uh, X failure. Okay. So those are the strength tests. So uh, as I said earlier, um, another type of test that we need to do is a consolidation test. So the, go the goal of the consolidation test is so that you can calculate the estimate of the ground settlement. Now sample disturbance here is very critical because if the fabric is very different from what was in the ground, then the amount of settlement that you'll calculate from the test parameters will be very different. Okay. Now the test can take again up to two weeks, depending on the test that you do. Now the output of the test are the consolidation parameters. So these are the compression index, the recompression index, uh, the coefficient of consolidation and the OCR. So this is what the odometer test looks like. So it's a fairly common test. I think most laboratories here are able to do this. 
Now it's a manual test. So meaning you have to put the loads on the sample every 24 hours. No? And it can take up to 14 days to do a test. Now on a, uh, an advancement of this is called the constant rate of, rate of strain test. Now it's a computer controlled test wherein you apply a constant rate of strain, hence the name. It takes only about three to five days no? compared to the odometer, which takes up to two weeks. Okay. Now, um, unfortunately, I don't think this is available locally. Uh, I do have a machine in my office, but that hasn't been used for a few years. Okay. Uh, so the last type of test is the moisture density test. No? So this is the one that's used for uh, providing the relationship between moisture and compaction density. So we always hear this in the field, no? So what is the maximum dry density? What is the optimum moisture content? So these, th these tests are what give you those numbers. So the first one is the Proctor test. So it was developed for granular soils and is therefore used for vibratory compactors. So you have the standard one, which is supposedly developed for lighter compactors. And then you have the modified one, which was designed, uh, which was, uh, sorry, was uh, developed because of the newer, heavier compactors. Now, this one is called the Harvard test. Um, as I said earlier, the, the standard and modified Proctor tests were developed for granular soils. So strictly speaking, uh, it shouldn't be used for cohesive soils. For cohesive soils, you should use the uh, Harvard test because of the way cohesive soils are supposed to be compacted, which is using a sheep's foot or a kneading roller. So the Harvard test replicates that type of action. Now, another common test is the CBR test. So this is what it looks like. It's uh, used for pavement design uh, and it gives you the value of the CBR. So in the field, it's easy to make adjustments to pavement designs once you have the CBR values. Okay, so that's it for laboratory testing. So we're gonna move on to in-situ testing. So again, we, I, I've, really, I've mentioned many times that um, laboratory testing is only good if your samples are able to represent the field conditions. So one way of actually getting field conditions is to do uh, in-situ testing, okay? So the most common one is what we call the standard penetration test. Uh, we also do the plate load test in some occasion. Now uh, the third uh, type of in-situ test is the cone penetrometer test. It's not as popular here, but uh, it's a very good test to do. Then we also have the pressure meter test and the field vein test. Okay. So again, the standard, pen, the standard penetration test, that's what we, the most common test that we do locally no, in the field. So it's when you take the split spoon sampler and you drop, uh, you, you hammer it into the ground using a, uh, using a 140 pound hammer uh, raised to 30 inches and you drive it for 450 millimeters. So there are multiple hammer types. So you have the automatic trip hammer, you have the free fall hammer. Uh, ideally you want to use the most efficient hammer you can, which is probably the automatic trip hammer. Now, typically what we do is we do the standard penetration test within the uh, every one meter within the upper six meters and then one and a half meters below six meters. But again, you can change this depending on the project requirements. Now we do the standard penetration test until a certain refusal criteria is met. You know? So normally it's 50 blows in any three of the 150 mm increments, or when you get to a total of 100 blows, or if there's no, you notice that the sampler does not move even after 10 successive blows. So, uh, oops. Let's see if uh, it's still playing. So this is a uh, this is how a standard penetration test is done. So you can see the hammer is attached to the drill string. Okay. So this is the hammer up here. Okay. 
Okay. So here they're just measuring uh, the height of the of the rod above the the soil. And this is it here. So, so the hammer is lifted and it's automatically released. This is an automatic trip hammer. Okay. Okay. Now this is a uh, another type. This is just using a just using using a uh, a non automatic trip hammer. Okay. So the guy just pulls the pulls on the pulley, which lifts the hammer, and then the hammer just drops. Okay. So the most important uh, parameter we get from the SPT is called the SPT end value. So it's the number of blows uh, that take, it's, it takes to drive the last 300 millimeters. Now the value, the end value, um, when, we, when we do some analysis, we always have to correct it to a reference energy level, which is usually 60% uh, efficiency. Okay. So ideally, this has to be calibrated in every project because each hammer is different. And then, of course, once we've uh, done the energy correction, we do an overburden stress correction so that uh, all the end values are referenced against a one atmosphere of pressure. And we combine those to get what's called the N160 value. And there are many published correlations for engineering parameters. So, so you can take those end values to get an estimate of the friction angle, of the cohesion, of the undrained shear strength, et cetera. Now, the main limitation of the end value is uh, one, of course, if you have a lazy field operator, like in the previous video, if the operator does not pull the hammer up to the required depth, then it will just, it won't give you the correct end value. Now, you can also uh, hit a piece of rock or a boulder or a piece of gravel that will artificially inflate your end value. And of course, if your clay deposit is sticky, you know, the, the, the tendency would be the clay would stick to the sampler and it will also, again, artificially inflate your end value. And of course, if you, during the washboarding procedure to advance the borehole, it disturbs the soil, your end value will be, will be different. You know? it, will, it might be lower than what it re should be, really should be. Now, I'm stressing this because in the Philippines, we, we rely heavily on the SPT end value for a lot of our an analysis. So, which is why we always stress that the, the, the field procedures have to be done well. So, another field test we can do, the plate load test. So, it measures the, the load settlement behavior of the ground. So, the way we do it is we just put a plate on the ground and a hydraulic jack with a counterweight to apply a load. Now the limitation of this is it, uh, it's the, the plate is small. So your load zone is only twice its width. So it's not very deep. So if you have a weaker soil material below and, and your load does not reach that layer, you're, you're not able to capture the deformation from that lower load. Okay. And of course, you also don't know the long-term settlement behavior. Now, the output of the test is an estimate of the bearing capacity and the modulus of subgrade reaction. So it's a useful test, provided you understand the limitation. So this is what it looks like. So you have a counterweight with a jack and a plate. So you just increase the pressure in the jack, which pushes against the, uh, against the counterweight to, to push the soil down. So this is the output. So it's a pressure versus deflection curve. And from there, you can get the modulus of, uh, modulus of subgrade reaction. Now, the third field test is the cone penetrometer test. Now, the cone penetrometer test, it involves an instrumented cone that you push into the ground. Okay? Now, there's a load cell at the tip. And then there's a friction sleeve where you, that measures the friction developed as the probe is pushed into the ground. Now, in some cones, there's also a piezometer at the tip to measure pore pressures. Now, the output of the test is, is uh, the cone resistance and the frictional resistance. 
And from there, you can use those values to, to with established correlations to, develop, to determine various engineering properties. Okay, so for example, um, for example, here, this is the cone with the tip resistance and then the friction ratio. And from there, there are established methods to determine if a soil is sand or clay. And then you can also have a measure of the permeability, uh, the Young's modulus, the relative density, the friction angle. You can even have a correlation to the SPT n value. Then you can also get the shear modulus, shear strength, uh, OCR values. And again, you can even get an estimate of the shear wave velocity. Now, it's a very useful test. Unfortunately, it's not used very much locally. Um, it's something I wish that uh, developers would consider more when we when doing soil investigations. But it is gaining popularity recently. No? And, and one advantage of it is that you are able to get a continuous profile of the soil. Unlike in the SPT, you're getting it at intervals. Of course, the drawback to the cone penetrometer is you don't get any samples. You don't have any samples to test in the lab. And there's no way to correlate or to check if, if what the cone penetrometer is giving you. So normally, this is done in tandem with the standard penetration test. Now, the fourth test is the pressure meter test. So uh, the pressure meter test involves placing a probe in the ground uh, and then inflating that probe. And that will give you a measure of uh, pressure versus volume change. And from there, you can get an estimate of the pressure meter modulus and the pressure meter limit pressure, which you can use to correlate it to the modulus of elasticity. Okay, so this is what a uh, typical output looks like. So with this, you're able to get a good measure of the deformation characteristics of the ground, of the soil. No? And at least you're, you'll be able to get a better estimate of how your building will behave, no? if, it's on a, if it's on a mat foundation or shallow footings. Now, the last field test that uh, we normally try to do is the field vein test. So basically, you insert a probe into a borehole and you twist it to get the shear strength. It's similar to the laboratory vein, but on a much larger, on a much bigger scale. So lastly, uh, I just wanted to describe what the typical soil investigation is in the Philippines. No? So typically what we do, uh, we do the uh, wash boring to advance the borehole. So in wash boring, you have a probe with high pressure jets that eject water into the ground, no? so to break up the soil. The cuttings are then floated to the ground surface and disposed of. Okay. And then, so you do that up to the level where you want to start the SPT, okay? So once you reach the required level, you start doing the SPT. And then if, for example, the ground is soft, you switch to an undisturbed sampler. If the ground is uh, not that soft, you just continue with the SPT. And then when you're done, you go back to the, to the wash boring and then you advance the hole again. Now, but if you encounter SPT refusal, you switch over to you switch over to rock coring. Here, you switch to core drilling, and then you get your rock samples. Now, uh, there there is a lot of criticism with the wash boring method because it may introduce some sampling disturbance in the ground, no? and hence your SPT n values may not be accurate. In in some countries, they do auger drilling. Uh, so that just so basically you're drilling the soil out. It's just a, it's a slow method. Then once you have all your samples, you go to the lab. The standard tests that are done are the sieve analysis, Atterberg limits, moisture content, unconfined compression test on rock, um, then the standard proctor test and CBR if you did test fits. Now, sometimes we, depending on the project, we have to request for a hydrometer, the free swell, specific gravity, unconfined compression test on clay, the odometer, and the direct shear. Uh, you'll notice I didn't put the triaxial shear test here because it's, uh, it's very hard to convince people to, to do the, the triaxial shear test. So your typical boring log would look like this. 
So you would have here your project name and the location of the site. Here you would have the water level depth and then the type of hammer that they used. So you know more or less Then after that, you have well, below, you'll have the soil description. And then your SPTN values should be given here. And then the recovery and RQD of the rock. The strength of the rock is here. And then the Atterberg limits are also given here together with the natural moisture content. Later on in the, in the report, you will also find the laboratory summary sheet where all of these data are summarized. Atterberg limits, uh, you, you'll have here how the Atterberg limits were derived and where they fall on the USCS classification system. And of course, you should also see the particle size analysis. And then you should also see a plot of the uh, unconfined compressive strength of the rock. So that's it, no? uh, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, uh, again, like, I, like Dr. Zarko and I discussed, we are hoping this would have a next, uh, a next session wherein we discuss how this then translates to a geotechnical report. Uh, I will just uh, I'll turn on my camera. Okay, so we have a number of questions here. Uh, mm -hmm. I've answered some of them. But uh, the other questions, which are interesting, I am going to throw to the panel of uh, our four uh, speakers. So one of the questions, and even, uh, uh, even Engineer Morales, so that uh, these can, uh, you know, I think that they both have uh, educational as well as entertainment value. <laughs> okay, so one question is, what happens when you have two subsurface investigations done on the same property and they come up with different results, <laughs> what do you believe? Or do you take the average of the two? Uh, yeah, so maybe Brian, what would you do in that particular situation? Uh, well, it's happened a few times. So, so the first thing I do is see if I've done something nearby, if I have data from a nearby site, and, and compare which one closely match or matches the other one better, no? So that's first. Second, of course, you look at the, I mean, I hate to say it, but you look at the reputation of the driller. You see if, uh, if you know if they're reliable or not. Uh, third, you also check um, geologic maps. Uh, you see if, if the conditions match what's given in the geologic map. And then I think what I would also do is take a look at the adjacent structures and, and see what type of, for example, what type of foundation system they use. If, if, if the foundation system they use matches the conditions given in one over the other, then you would think that, you know, this one's been there for quite some time, it looks okay, then maybe this other set is, is better, it's okay. more reliable. Uh, I'll ask uh, Mark uh, Morales, have you ever had the experience where there is a person that comes to, let's say, PGA, asks you uh, to do a subsurface investigation, and then after you submit the report, they say, oh, we had the previous thing done, and your results are very different from those previous results. So what do you normally, how do you answer that in that particular situation? Uh, we've had several instances where, you know, like, so normally, um, uh, like, like uh, let me pre preface this, no? um, normally we ask is, have there, uh, like, the first question we ask is whenever we're asked to be engaged, no, no? have there been previous borings done in a particular area? Some, most of the time, wala naman, but in the cases where there have been, you know, it's honestly, we try to stay away from those types of projects because, yeah, I mean, like, I can see Brian smiling. It's basically like, nagahanap ka ng patong ipupukpuk mo sa ulo mo in those particular instances. Yeah, but, yeah, but, um, because, ano, it really, dip, ano, it, it's hard sometimes na, uh, and uh, you have to forgive me for saying this also. Sometimes, clients also want to hear the, the ano, eh, they want to get the answer that they want to hear. So if it's an unfavorable or an expensive quote unquote na solution, they try to shop around. 
So I, the, I think the off the bat, the best way to do it is find someone reputable and find someone that you trust, and don't get someone na mura lang, and then you will second guess the 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 the, the recommendation. Eh. So I guess that's my answer. So I didn't really directly answer that question, but I think that's the best way to go about it. Is find someone that you trust and you know believe believe believe, believe what they say. I mean, don't don't wait for an answer that you just want to hear. Eh. Okay. Ah, next question. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, so one uh, one uh, of our participants asked, let's say, for example, you have the subsurface investigation of the next property. What is the value of doing a subsurface investigation for that property? Can't you just use the neighboring property in lieu of a subsurface investigation? So I'll ask Brian first. Let's say well, Brian gives you a subsurface investigation. They, uh, turns out to be the subsurface inv investigation of the neighboring property, not the site that you have. Has that ever well, happened? It's, it's happened. Uh, again, it's not something we recommend uh, simply because you don't know how the soil conditions will vary from point to point. And, and believe me, even sometimes even a 20 meter difference it makes a big difference. Now, in fact, there's one project I'm looking at. Uh, since the two properties are right next to each other, and this one suggests you need to use piles, this one suggests you don't need piles. Now, whether or not both are correct, that, that's another thing. But then if, let's say, let's say they're both correct, and you're this property and you just have this information, then you'll have a problem with your structure. Okay. And, and I guess I don't think it's that big of a cost hmm. to, to, to have to deal with. I mean, take note, when, when, once you put the foundation in, the cost to repair the foundation is a lot more than the cost of a soil investigation. Okay. Uh, next question deals with what happens for small projects, so I'll also ask Alexis this. Uh, what are the options to doing a subsurface investigation? Pwede bang visual na lang? Well, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, no? Uh, if, I cite, if we cite the building code, any structure to two stories below, you can just make an, uh, an assumption on the bearing capacity. And I think the reason for that is, uh, number one, uh, an overestimate or an underestimate of the bearing capacity and an overestimate of the foundation won't affect your cost that much if you're just talking of a one level or a two level house. But beyond two stories, you cannot get a building permit if you don't have the soil investigation uh, test results. And I think the reason for that is uh, very well, uh, very well uh, founded. Again, as what our speaker said, you can look at the geology, adjacent uh, properties, and the general, you, you, most of the time, you have a general feel of the area. So again, my experience with one, two-story houses, the structural engineer simply assumes uh, 3,000 uh, PSF or 144 kPa. But sometimes, nagmi miss because sometimes uh, it's a very soft area, formerly rice land, naglagay ng uh, house, and uh, 144 kPa might Sometimes it's just too much. Uh, baka 90 kPa lang or 100 kPa. So again, as uh, as what uh, Brian has said, the cost of soil investigation is very very small. Uh, it's like, it's like buying insurance, no? Uh, I'll spend the uh, X amount of pesos just to make sure that throughout the design life of my building, uh, the foundations will be okay. And and the reality is that we we really have a hard time convincing owners to spend this amount, you know, uh, for example, half a million pesos on soil investigation for a 400 million peso building. Sometimes uh, we, 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 we still have problems convincing the owner to, to spend. So I think that's a challenge for us uh, geotechnical hmm. engineers. Okay. Uh, what about, I don't know, I'm just adding this. What about the possibility of not doing an SPP but doing certain things like SW, like Swedish weight sounding test or a dynamic cone test. Mm. This is if it's a small thing. Um, what is your, I'll ask Alexis this question. 
what is your uh, take on doing some of these tests that do not really require a drill rig if it's just uh, yeah. uh yes uh, if you do the swedish uh, weight sounding test or the dynamic cone in which you you have a small weight i think it's eight kilograms uh all of these eventually end up to a correlation of bearing capacity uh there, there's literature to to support if your uh, the number of revolutions in your swedish weight sounding is this much there's an associated uh, bearing capacity and based on my experience, the bearing capacity that they give is more or less uh, very conservative. No? Okay. So uh, I guess uh, for again for one uh, two story uh, buildings, uh, this is uh, this is good. I think this is where the uh, the uh, design code gives us a little leeway for one level or two level uh, uh, structures. Of course. Uh, a big manufacturing plant that is one level, exception ito, no? you, you cannot consider it to be to, to still be a one level. You, you need soil investigation for this. But for small structures, I think the, the simpler tools are, uh, are okay. Uh, there's a question. How long do you recommend to repeat a soil investigation if the project implementation is delayed for years. So in other words, if we did a project, we did a subsurface investigation, the project got delayed uh, for a number of years, how long do you need to, uh, what time until you need to redo the subsurface investigation? Uh, let me let me answer that quickly. No, uh, if if there's a gap between the time uh, of a of a previous in, investig soil investigation and the present, the real question is what what happened to the site? Perhaps it was a staging area for a backfill. Uh, was it uh, was it flooded? Uh, was it uh, excavated? Th th this is really the if you're one hundred percent sure that really nothing happened to the site. So we say in geologic time. Uh, what we mean by that is 100, 200 years, the geologic formation won't change. But again, especially if you're near uh, Metro Manila, if you look at the history of the site, uh, it became a staging area. It became a motor pool in which the oil of their trucks were spilled. So again, I, 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 uh, for me personally, I, I recommend, well, of course, previously, if you did 20 boreholes, perhaps just do five or six, just to confirm that, you no. Know, uh, everything is still. That is really the uh, that is really the uh, the question. Sometimes uh, it was used as a previous uh, uh, barracks in which, when you start excavating, you see the the the, the footings of the barracks. So again, it's a disturbance that, that is the issue. Okay. Uh, one last question. I think I'll be the one to answer this. Is that are you aware, or maybe I can ask. And then I think I have an, are there published correlations for CU? I, I would uh, understand it to be SU with N values in NCR. Are any of you aware of uh, correlations for NCR? For undrained shear strength in NCR. So I would say SU all over P versus N. Any, uh, any uh, what you call that? Any uh, things you could suggest? So Brian, you're not aware of any. You mean local correlations? In, uh, in uh, Metro Manila, maybe in Manila. Not really, although in the, in the DPWH, BSDS, there is a, they do give a correlation, but again, it's a general correlation, not general specific to. What yeah. about Mark? No, uh, no, not that no. you know. Of. No, not that I know of. Yeah. Uh, uh, the closest I have heard of is the, the study that you and Brian are doing on Guadalupe Tufna na strength, right? But but for SPT and and soils, and uh, not aware of. I'm not okay. aware of anything. So this is what I would normally answer to this question because uh, my students have asked me the same question before. So um, 
I asked Richard Tan because his thesis was on the SU all over P, C sub C, the, uh, I, I know at least T sub C and SU all over P now. Uh, I do think that when they say SPT, we assume that this is not only SPT, but there were classification tests because there are values there of the SPT, but you also need to take into consideration the, uh, the Atterberg limits. The, the, I think in that particular case, it's uh, the liquid limit or the plastic limit. So as far as I know, Richard Tan of Advanced Geotechnical Engineering Systems, uh, his uh, thesis was on uh, that particular topic. So uh, you, can, you can write him and ask for a copy of his thesis. So, okay, I'll end there. We will try to answer some of the open questions uh, afterwards by emailing you, but I would like to thank uh, our speakers, our four speakers, to Dr. Butuyan, to Dr. Akasho, of course, to uh, Engineer Santos, and of course, to Engineer Brian Tan, I really thank you. This, uh, this webinar would not have been possible if you had not volunteered uh, for, for this. And the mix of topics ranged from the very novel uh, uh, research that is being done to the down-to-earth questions of soil investigation, how to mitigate liquefaction, and how to do a slope stability analysis. So I'd like to thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers. I would also like to thank our sponsors because this would also not be possible with, uh, without the support of our sponsors to PIC and of course our participants because if they were not here, there would not be a webinar. So thank you very much and I give back the floor uh, finally to Eric. Uh, thank you, thank you Doc Mark. Ano? And again, thank you to our speakers. Parang na deja vu ako nung nakita ko kanina, puro para ako nasa college ulit. <laughs> yung mga speakers natin kanina mga si Brian <laughs> Brian Alan and uh, Star in the Million si Eric Santos were my <laughs> students and, <laughs> and uh, Alexis used to be my classmate and now my colleague so we're all related sama-sama <laughs> uh, <laughs> tayo <laughs> or, and then <laughs> And then, org mates tayong tatlo ni Brian, Eric. <laughs> Ayun niya, exactly, exactly. Kaya para tayo nasa college lang ulit. So, And for the, again, for, for the record, uh, mas mataas ang batch niyo sa akin. Mas matanda kayo sa akin. Oo, <laughs> <for the record. laughs> oh, okay. kabatch ko yan si, si Brian. Kabatch ko na naging professor ko ng master's din. So, again, thank you for your, thank you for your time. Ano? And thank you for, for yung shinare niyo. And I think based on the questions, ang dami pang questions, I think okay to mga basic na kumbaga going back to yung mga basic uh, concepts natin ng geotechnical and I guess this would also be applicable to the other uh, fields of engineering so probably we'll be having more of these types of uh, conference or webinar and siguro I think some of the questions in the geotechnical let's say I was planning on actually having yung if, if some of you have, who have attended before the PICE sessions na it's more of like a Q&A type of webinar ano so siguro we'll have those also again kasi kagaya dito questions is it just keeps on rolling ano lang eh pasok nang pasok about it's very concept and very practical questions yung tinatanong and it's really um kumbaga as for PIC and for the ISG okay yung tanong na yan because we really need to address those things ano those basic things that we initially assumed that dapat alam na natin as engineers but apparently there's a lot of questions that are popping up about those things ano so again thank you very much and um uh, before i move on with the um the certificate of appreciation to our two speakers i would like to again and uh based on the chat kasi meron daw hindi nakapag uh answer no questions kanina no so we'll we'll post again the four links for the four questions on the topics on the four topics so we'll post ulit i think naka-post na diyan 
take note may time limit yan ha para exam talaga yan parang quiz hindi siya hindi siya ano hindi siya parang pop quiz yan ha hindi yan wala unlimited time so make sure you answer those and we will also post the evaluation form these are all forms that are required for your attendance as well as for the certificate and the CPD points na ma ma earn you dito so make sure that you answer all the evaluation form and uh, uh sorry the, all the questions uh, and the evaluation form so while you're doing that uh, i'd like to present uh, uh the certificate of appreciation to our speakers so may i like to give the first certificate of appreciation to engineer jose carlo eric santos and grateful appreciation of his participation as a speaker on the topic design considerations for high reinforced soil structures in a mountainous and seismically active region in the zone and for his invaluable contribution to the success of the webinar on geotechnical engineering held on May 21, 2020 using the cloud, Zoom, and Experto uh, platforms. Uh, signed engineer uh, Frederick Sison, National Treasurer and Chair of the Interspecialty Group Committee, Dr. Erdson Renesuero, the National President, and attested by Engineer Peter Paul, our National Secretary. So again, thank you, Engineer thank you. Santos. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to present this certificate of appreciation to Brian Tan in grateful appreciation for his participation as speaker on the topic subsurface investigation and for his invaluable contribution to the success of the webinar on geotechnical engineering held on May 21, 2021 through our Zoom and Experto platform. Signed yours truly, really, uh, uh, Dr. Erdson Renesuero and attested by Engineer Peter Baldi. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, PIC. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Ayan, so may, may utang daw sa atin yung geotech, ano? Sa isang topic pa raw nila. Continuations. <laughs> we'll, we'll have that again. <laughs> okay, so I guess that... Uh, Doc, Zark, Doc Mark, meron pa ba kayong uh, supposed to be closing remarks kayo? But I think you already gave your closing remarks. So meron ka pa idadagdag, Doc Mark? Wala na, wala na. Okay na, sige. So uh, uh, lastly, uh, I, I think our... Who is still here? I think uh, Sir Bong. And actually, I'd like to also... Uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, Engineer Praxedes Bernardo from PRC. So, ayan. So, Shane mismo nagmo-monitor sa ating event ngayon. Maybe, Ma'am Praxi, maybe you have some few words to our participants. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear distinguished colleagues. This webinar is uh, being held at the same time doon <laughs> sa ASEP, yeah, International <laughs> Convention. So, uh, I was there earlier, but there was a glitch in the sound. So I switched to this <laughs> webinar. And from that time, I was glued to the seminar because the topics are very interesting and the speakers delivered very well. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge uh, Brian. Hello. Uh, we consulted him in 2013. It seems to me you have not aged. Me, <laughs> Uh, there were 208 participants earlier, and um, what came into my mind was, um, well, first, congratulations to the ISD group. So perhaps um, uh, I'm just taking this opportunity to make a follow-up with you regarding our <laughs> career progression and specialization program. Now, um, there is something which came to my mind. Is it possible for you to um, develop a national geotechnical code of the Philippines? Kasi we, we only have the structural code. How about the geotechnical code? Para naman you can really assert na the yung ano, importance of uh, being a geotechnical engineer. I think the, uh, the field is really an important one. Kasi sabi nga lang, pinakamahirap na kalaban yung nature. And we're dealing with the earth. Napakaraming unknown. And um, I was listening to some of the questions, yung kagaya ng kung magkaiba ba yung results from two uh, reports na magkalapit lang. Uh, which one are you going to take? Well, nangyari na rin yan sa amin. Um, uh, 
sinasabi niya na pwede siya ng spread foundation pero pag, pag tinig namin and value niya hanggang 6 meters is nasa 1 lang. So something like that. Um, it's possible that some uh, consultants or prepared the report parang yung bang sanay na sa lugar, they do not really uh, undertake the necessary, like what Brian discussed about kung ano ba yung talagang um, test that you really need to conduct. Uh, bihira kong makita yung triaxial test at saka yung mga yung, yung rock uh, coring. Bihira kong makita yun eh. Parating na lang after bird limit, ano, yun lang, tapos sasabihin na nila. Uh, ganun na sa SPED Foundation. Nangyari na rin yan sa amin ang um, recommendation ng structural designer was board piling. So the, the cost of the structure was so high. The client cannot afford it. Pwede naman pala kaming mag ano lang, mag uh, pile driving with uh, precast piles. And then there was the consideration kasi Manila, so you have to provide vibration, hammer down. Pero sabi naman, if you vibrate, lalo mong madidisturb yung lupa. Is it right, Dr. Mark? <laughs> kasi <laughs> ang Manila is prone to liquefaction, so when you do uh, driving using vibration hammer, so lalo mo, lalo mo na lang daw ginuli yung lupa. And then yung, yung dewatering, um, in some of the projects of uh, my husband, I keep telling to the engineers, huwag kayong magde-de-water kung hindi necessary. Because as Brian told me before, when you pump water out, then the soil content comes with the uh, with water. Kaya nakakaroon ng settlement sa adjoining property. And uh, I think um, this really, most of our civil engineers should, uh, perhaps if you come up with the National Geotechnical Code, maybe they will be aware. At uh, when they find it na meron silang ready reference, perhaps that will encourage them to go into technical engineering. This is really a very uh, important field. And I hope more of our civil engineers will go into specialization sa geotechnical engineering kasi kailangan natin ito talaga. Actually, I have many questions, pero nahiyala akong magtanong <laughs> regarding that. So, uh, congratulations to the ISD group. Uh, you have done so well. Uh, in upgrading and uh, providing you know, learning. Sa, sabi mo nga, Eric, parang classroom. Sabi, in, I was thinking kanina na kahit kami mga seniors, we need this refresher course. Kasi hearing them, uh, it's, it's really, you know, but you also realize that you know so little on so many things uh, when you listen to these uh, great speakers. So keep uh, doing these uh, webinars and I hope I will always get invitation from you. Yes, because right. I really would like to listen to uh, most of the distinguished speakers uh, that uh, we had this, uh, today. Okay, so congratulations again. Thank you all so much for uh, ha having me. And yun um, yung kalimutan, Dr. Mark, yung CPSP natin. We have to move forward. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Very encouraging din yun. Ano? And we really appreciate that. You appreciated our seminars, ano? So uh, again, thank you, Ma'am Praxi. Uh, again, before last, before I call on our president for his uh, final words, Siguro, I'd just like to again thank our sponsors, PGA Tech Group of Companies, uh, that's Peter Ground Improvement Incorporated, PGA Earth Structures Solutions Incorporated, PGA GeoPier Philippines Incorporated, uh, Philippine Geoanalytics Incorporated, we have AMH Philippines Incorporated, uh, Quali Qualitest Solutions and Technologies Incorporated, and Experto. So for Experto, we have actually, I think, uh, 900 to 1,000 participants. Din, no? So uh, uh, maliban pa po dito sa Zoom natin. So marami-rami talaga tayo nag-attend uh, to this uh, webinar. So yun po again, thank you from on behalf of the ISG. Uh, thank you very much for attending for the participants for attending this webinar. Uh, hindi bumaba yung ano natin, yung participation natin dito. I was monitoring the number of participants and all throughout it was the same number. So andyan kayo. Uh, thank you for staying. Um, to our speakers again, maraming 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 salamat. And now I'd like to uh, share, uh, I'd like to call on our president again. Maybe he has some final words. So Sir Bong. Thank you, Sir Eric. You know? Uh, to the ISG group, really, uh, I am very, very uh, uh, grateful for this uh, uh, webinar, especially to the specialty division of uh, geotechnical engineering. Uh, Dr. Mark, no, thank you very much. And uh, of course, to uh, 
our uh, BRB OCE chair, our uh, chair of the CPD Council, uh, si Ma'am Proxy, and we have also here one of the members of the CPD Council uh, with us, and uh, also to our past presidents and uh, uh, our uh, board of directors who are here uh, present uh, also during this webinar. And uh, really, I would like to uh, especially uh, thank our uh, speakers, no? yung uh, mga apat na magagaling talaga natin na speakers. So I salute you uh, all for this uh, very good uh, uh, webinar this afternoon. And uh, of course, I'd like to announce that uh, next month, uh, we would be having our uh, uh, mid-year convention and technical conference. It would be two days, uh, June 25 and 26. So what, what's out for uh, the registration? Again, but uh, I would like to, to uh, really uh, push that, uh, please, no? uh, reg register only if uh, you are uh, uh, really be attending. Uh, the event no because uh, uh, we have uh, noticed that uh, uh, there were uh, uh, engineers or civil engineers PIC members who, who registered but uh, they did not attend the session no? so uh, sayang naman for uh, those uh, other interested uh, members no? so uh, just be careful because we will be uh, checking that now, uh, we have already uh, announced it that uh, you should uh, uh, register if you will really attend the webinar. No? So uh, be careful of that, uh, my uh, the PIC members. So with that, uh, uh, thank you again to everyone for your uh, time uh, to attend the webinar. A very, very uh, good. No? A webinar this afternoon. So uh, with that, uh, Eric, for your last... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Words. Thank you, sir Bong. So that's it. So yeah, you coming know, from President. So uh, again, reminder, don't forget, save the date on June for our mid-year convention. Your links are still there. So make sure you register. Uh, make sure you fill in the questions and the evaluation. So maraming maraming salamat. And uh, that's it. That's the end of our webinar. Thank you. And stay safe and stay healthy. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Doc Mark. Thank you. Let me Bra see. Si Brian, para oh, nag-lecture talaga ng ano eh. Para ako nag-attend ng... Para ako nasa ano ulit, Melchor Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Buti walang quiz. <laughs> <laughs> si Mark eh. Si Mark Morales mo siya. Special mention ka lagi ni Doc Mark Zarco ah. Dapat... Eh, si Doc si pagka-controversial yung topic ako tinatanong eh. <laughs> Ay kita niya yung panic sa mukha mo eh. <laughs> <laughs> Ay yung mga, yung mga ayaw ko. Yung mga iniiwas ako na, na topic din na hinaan. Mga controversial eh. <laughs> <laughs> this is like an indai badi day. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, 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 Brad Bong, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sir Lawrence, thank you, ah, nakahabu. Yeah, Sir Lawrence, you. thank you. Thank you, Sir Eric. Thank you, Sir Bong. Yeah. Thank you, Sel. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Oh, pwede ka na mag-send ulit. Pwede ka na ulit mag-send, Mark. Ha? Nang ano? Ano ba, ano ba rin ni-receive mo? Ano ba rin ni-receive mo? <laughs> Kala mo seryoso sa... Hindi na ako kasi puro mga ano puro mga lightning mga lightning lightning rod na mga topic yung ibabato sa akin kasi iyan ang lagi pinag-uusapan namin eh. Kaya parang laging yung mga yung mga controversial na mga ganyan. Hindi, pero niyan, ang hirap niyan. Normal na nangyayari yon na pag ayaw ng kliyente yung sagot na mabibigay ng isang consultant, lilipat sa kabila. 
Parang ano, di ba? Parang doktor. Pag-ayaw mo yung... <laughs> pag-ayaw, pag-ayaw mo marinig na mamamatay ka, sasabihin mo, kaya na ba? Doon ka sa doktor na sasabihin sa'yo, kaya ng vitamins. Uh, si Airpad, gano'n. Pag sinabi yung bawal uminom, maghahanap ng doktor na magsasabi sa kanya, pwede pa siyang uminom. <laughs> gano'n na gano'n. <laughs> sige, sige. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Congrats, ha. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. Congrats. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Hi, sir. Oliver. Ayos. Ano? Oliver, thank you. Sel, thank you. Thank you din, sir. What time shall we close the link? Nagpe-play ka pa ba? Hindi na. Wala ka nang piniplay. Uh, i-play mo na namin ngayon yung lahat ng AVPs. Oh, play mo mo. Close. Oh, play mo tapos after nun. Sara mo na yung link pagkatapos. Okay. Play okay. Mo okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>